Okay, so um, I think we're uh, we're about ready to start. Um, so I'll introduce our uh, our first speaker. It's uh, Chris Kotcher. Um, Chris is the founder and executive director of COVID Survivors for Change. Uh, he's the co-author of a project, National COVID-19 Remembrance, which was an art installation and memorial to victims of COVID-19. Um, pre previously, uh, Chris launched the Every Town Survivor Network, which is the uh, nation's largest community of gun violence survivors working to end co uh, gun violence. Um, so Chris, welcome. Whenever you're ready, feel free to, uh, to say hello. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm here today to talk about um, the intersection between advocacy and trauma. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I think that I have heard most often from people um, who have experienced trauma, who are interested in advocating for change and sharing their story as part of uh, any of the processes that we have in our power to make change is that it can be extremely healing. Um, but also can be re-traumatizing. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today is some of the best practices that I have learned um, over the past 10 years or so. Um, my background is as an attorney, and like uh, Derek said, I then worked in the gun violence prevention space and now working with families impacted by COVID. Um, so just uh, to as a sort of ground setting, um, what we mean when we say trauma, um, trauma is an individual result from an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances um, that is experienced by an individual um, and experiences either physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has adverse effects on the functioning um, and mental or physical or social or emotional or even spiritual well-being. Perceives. Um, as having both lasting and adverse effects. Um, and so when we take that into what the work that we're doing, and then we think about what does that mean to be trauma-informed, trauma-informed means that as you're working with people who have been impacted by trauma, um, that you do a couple of things. One is that you realize um, that there is a widespread impact of trauma. It can have a whole bunch of different, it can show up in a whole bunch of different ways, um, that you are committing to recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, that you may have in some of the folks that you're working with, um, that you are responding by trying to integrate knowledge about trauma into your programs, your trainings, um, whatever your offerings are, the procedures, um, however you are working with people, both volunteers or staff. Um, and then you seek to actively resist re-traumatization. So that's sort of going that one step further and being proactive about thinking about how to, how to build programs that are trauma-informed. So just a couple of key points, and then I wanted to talk about, a, I'm big on acronyms, so I have a, a snazzy little acronym to share to help sort of think about how to put this into practice. Um, but I think some of the things that I have learned um, that have been most helpful to me over the past 10 years or so is that um, first is that, you know, resiliency um, and grief and trauma and hope uh, can all exist in the same person, sometimes even at the same time, right? We, we like to put people in boxes, we like to say, um, well, you have experienced this, so therefore you must feel that. Um, and the truth is that like all people, um, like we know in our own lives and each other's lives, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so even something that can be incredibly healing um, can also be re-traumatizing. Something that can be really hard to do or really emotional can also be healing. And so what one of the things that we can bring into this space is seeking to try to emphasize and bring forth that healing aspects of advocacy while also minimizing um, the potential harm. Um, the second is know what you know and uh, and ask others when you don't know. So when I first started working with uh, people impacted by trauma, like I said, I uh, was an attorney. Um, I worked in corporate law, so I did not have um, experience, professional experience um, with trauma or counseling or anything like that. Um, but what I did know was that uh, I knew how to participate in legislative change. I knew how to be part of the political process, part of um, advocating for change. What I didn't know was about trauma. And so I sought out experts um, to help flesh out and build um, into the programs that I was working on. And then, um, you know, recently when I was like in the gun violence prevention movement after March for Our Lives, um, we started working with um, students. And so thinking about that was another area that I didn't know that much about. So bringing experts to help flesh out um, and support the work that you're doing. Um, 
ask questions and listen. Um, that is goes um, beyond. Um, and then just some basic um, self-care tips that we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, the acronym that I wanted to share with you all is CARE, which is clear communication, active listening, R is respect choice, and E is empower. And I'll go through a little bit about what each of those mean. But basically, it's just a little shorthand that you can um, take into the work that you're doing um, when you're working with families, if you are working with families who have been impacted by trauma, that you can bring into your practice um, and really sort of work together um, to impact um, as much change as possible. So clear communication. Um, this means communicating clearly um, and setting expectations early. Um, and you know, sometimes we don't know, uh, you know, being part of uh, a pandemic, being part of um, advocating to end a pandemic means that, um, you know, it's often that things are going to change. Um, things will change day by day, um, and that's okay, but just be really sure that you're um, clearly communicating. Um, know your own boundaries. Um, so for me, um, I tend to um, I tend to not be very good at setting boundaries, um, and that's okay. That works for me. Um, I think you know being really clear about um, what your limitations are. Um, are you someone who you know is uh, you know uh, works late in the evenings but doesn't work in the mornings? Um, are you someone who doesn't uh, you know work on the weekends or works during the week? But more importantly, when you're set entering into a conversation with someone, just being really clear about what the boundaries of that conversation are. You know, I have. We have about 30 minutes to talk. Um, so here's what I wanted to go over with you. So you're entering into that conversation so that person knows um, what to expect. Make the implicit explicit. Um, this is one of those um, can be helpful in, in really any situation, um, but make the implicit explicit. So if it's in your mind, say it out loud. Um, when you say, hey, I need you to show up, uh, if you don't mind being a little bit early, right? What does that mean? I need you there 10 minutes early. Um, when we started, you know, when we, for, for this talk, um, I got clear communications, please show up 10 minutes before the scheduled time if you can, right? So that was very clear and very appreciated. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, we're all human. We're all here to make change. We're all here to save lives. We're here to end um, the pandemic. Um, we're going to make mistakes with language, with, uh, with our interactions, and that's okay. Give yourself that grace and permission to make mistakes. Um, Instead of, you know, you've heard of the golden rule, the platinum rule, um, it's not about what um, what you want or what you would want done unto you, but what the other person wants. So think about what that person is, um, what would make them feel comfortable um, in the situation that you're working with. Um, and some basic pointers, uh, this is probably common sense, but um, I, I prefer to avoid um, explicit um, references to God, not knowing what the other person's faith may or may not be. Um, saying things like, I know what you're going through, um, using presumptive phases, um, oh, I, I know exactly where, where you've been. Um, that, those are all, um, I think, ways to, to diminish and um, devalidate someone's experience in trauma. The A is for active listening. Um, so, you know, you're an advocate or you're a scientist or you are someone who is advocating um, for, um, for change. You're not a counselor. Um, if you're not, if you don't have that background, and that's okay. Uh, being really clear with that, um, no one is expecting that kind of background in this work, um, and that's okay. Um, active listening, validate. So um, validating someone's experience is a really simple way. A really uh, simple way to do that is, is I, is I know, I know I, it sounds like what you're saying your experience has been is X, Y, or Z. Um, follow the person's lead. So that means listening um, and not sort of automatically jumping ahead to what you want to say. Um, and really importantly, I think listening, we, we all, um, especially if we are people who want to make good in the world and want to bring about change, um, we have a tendency, or at least I do, to jump in and want to fix things. I do that with my family. It drives them crazy. Um, so that's a really important um, sort of uh, putting that break on yourself. Um, listening means not necessarily doing or trying to fix um, what with you. It is just listening. And sometimes for someone who has been through something traumatic, um, the act of listening is, is, is a gift, um, is, a, is a real deep gift that they have not had the benefit from of others in their lives. Um, respect, autonomy, and choice. So this is a really important thing. And we said, one of the things I'd like to say is that it's the person's, the, the advocate's um, choice every single time. So maybe they've said that they want to uh, participate in a legislative meeting. Maybe they've said they want to sign on to the op-ed. Maybe they've said they want to um, you know, participate um, in any number of actions. Every single time you've asked, 
maybe this time is different. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe it's the anniversary of a birthday or a holiday or some other really difficult day. So it's their choice um, each time. Avoid surprises. Um, like I said, this is an issue where things are constantly in flux and that's okay. Where you can, where you can bring in the information about what to expect, walking through an agenda, walking through a meeting, walking through who's gonna be in the meeting, walking through what to expect. All those things are gonna help put someone's mind at ease. Um, and then uh, avoiding comparisons. Um, so that's another way uh, to, to avoid, um, you know, saying, well, this is just like that. Um, everyone's experience is unique. Um, and, uh, and while trauma is, has some commonalities across different experiences and across different traumas, everyone's path of healing and trauma is also individual to where they are. And then finally, empower. So what I like to say is uh, my job is to help someone make an informed decision, right? So my job is not to say, hey, this is a good thing for you to do, or this is not a good thing for you to do. You've been doing a lot. You shouldn't do this. My job is to help them imagine what doing that would be like. So um, if it's testifying before a legislative body, right, maybe it will be asking them to review um, uh, legislative testimony of others who have spoken. Uh, maybe it will be talking to someone who has done that before. Um, if it's speaking to media, right, it's going to be maybe sitting in a small group and practicing those, those questions um, in a small group one-on-one. Um, anything, anything that you can do to help that person understand what that experience is like, short of actually doing it, of course, um, will help them decide for themselves and in consultation with their family and friends whether that action is, is right for them and a good step forward for them. Um, and then finally, you know, what you can control um, and what you can't control. Um, you know, the, these are things change. I keep on saying this, but things change um, often at the last minute. Um, and so there will be things that you can control and there will be things that you can't control. And so being really upfront about, you know, here's what we're expecting, but we also know that things can change. And so this might shift or that might shift um, for the extent that things are firm um, and locked in, sharing that, but also, you know, we just, when things are impossible, when, when it's possible that things might change, um, making sure that you're sharing that knowledge as well. Um, so that's what I wanted to, I wanted to make sure I left time for questions. So those are just a quick overview of some basic tips that you can bring in to your practice um, as uh, a scientist or um, a advocate or, or whatever your role is in our shared efforts um, to end the pandemic. And I hope that was helpful. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we've got, um, we've got plenty of time for questions, about, about eight minutes. Um, and maybe I can, I can start. I wonder, I, yeah, I wonder if you could just briefly introduce us to your sort of two COVID projects, the uh, COVID Survivors for Change and the um, National Day of Remembrance. Yeah, absolutely. I can talk quickly about how I got involved. So um, I live in Queens um, in New York City. And uh, when that first wave of the pandemic hit, um, my you know, my neighborhood was was devastated, like so many others in New York City. And so um, I had friends that had COVID and, and had, uh, you know, loved ones at my daughter's school that um, were taken. And so I started thinking about, you know, what I could bring into this space, similar to what I had done in gun violence. And so the first thing that we did when we sat down and talked to folks that had been impacted by COVID, um, which is something that is, you know, through to this day, right, this feeling of, and especially under the previous um, administration here in the US, this feeling that um, the loss was not being recognized um, and that people's um, pain, um, their symptoms, um, their loss was not being recognized, people's loved ones were not being remembered. And so the first thing that we did was sit down and, and hosted a uh, the National COVID Remembrance uh, in Washington, DC um, in October with 20,000 empty chairs signifying the lives that had been taken um, here in the United States. Um, sadly, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives ago. Um, and the, since then, what we've some of the other programming that we've done, we've launched um, trainings on um, how to share your story on social media, how to speak to media. Um, we do a support group, um, online support group every Thursday evening uh, for anyone who um, has been impacted by COVID. Um, and we're building out additional programs um, and trainings, trauma-informed trainings to um, help people be part of the process for change. Thanks, Chris. I, I've sort of been uh, involved in, in sort of joining a few uh, Zoom chats where um, there's like a new zero COVID group and like new people are meeting each other for the first time. And 
it seems like one of like the very first things that like most people want to do is just sort of like vent and explain their situation. And um, yeah, I'm wondering how, how important you think that is to sort of like in the very beginning sort of, I don't know, just get some things off your chest before you actually like get jump straight into like work. Well, I think, I mean, I think it depends on the person. I think for some people, um, well, I should, I should say I have worked with people who have jumped right in and the advocacy um, and fighting for change and fighting, you know, in this case and the pandemic um, is, you know, I've had people say to me, it's, it's their version of therapy. Um, and so for some people, they want to jump right in um, and, uh, and that's their focus. They don't want this to happen to anyone else. Um, the pain that they're experiencing. And so that's where their primary focus lies. I think for everyone, I think what you said was um, the venting, I think, or you know, I don't I want to say venting, so it's, that sounds uh, like it's not valid, but um, but the sharing of, um, of personal story and perspective and experience, um, I think is really important. And I think um, with anything at this scale, and I saw the same thing with gun violence, is that um, people have um, there's so much um, of shared bonding that goes along with with that sh with sharing um, of a person's story and experience, and I think um, even you know even in, in a in a an individual family, um, you know you may have uh, you know someone who um, who has passed away, um, but you know a father losing a child is different than a mother losing a child is different than a sibling um, losing losing someone, and so even within the same family, you could have different perspectives. And sometimes, you know, coming together to share um, with people that have that as that very similar shared experience um, can be extremely healing, um, just to and, and validating. Yeah. So um, I'll sort of open up the floor a little bit. If anybody has any questions for Chris, you can um, you can put them in the chat. We also have a um, a Slack channel just for for this session where we can sort of discuss all sorts of community stuff in that Slack channel um, when we're done. Um, Chris, do you have anything, uh, any final comments? No, I'll just, I'll drop my uh, email in the chat box as well. Um, and I will, um, I'm around here or then, um, I see there is a question. How would a 16 year old feel if a school is closed? Well, I think, um, you know, I think that, uh, again, I don't think, I don't think it's, um, any one uniform. So the question was, how would a 16 year old feel if a school is closed due to COVID-19 resurgence? Um, I think it, it sort of depends on the child. I mean, you have, for example, some children who may be home in a situation that's dangerous because of um, abuse, um, that they might want to be back in school. I think you have some children um, who may be bad in their family or in their extended family. So I think it, I don't think there's any uniform uh, perspective um, that that one person might have. I think it sort of depends. Um, and there's a you know huge spectrum of how people might perceive that situation. Yeah, it's sort of a good reminder that there's like sort of these direct impacts and traumas that come from COVID, like the actual like illness or a family member had something. Then there's all sorts of indirect things uh, going on, like school closures and home trauma and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I think uh, I think now is a good time to um, to move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, Chris's email is in the chat. Feel free to, to reach out, and um, Chris might also be on the uh, on the Slack channel to answer any questions if you guys want to follow up. Okay. Our next speaker is. Um, Let's see, who is our next speaker? Oh, Sinead. Um, uh, Sinead has been a member of the Independent Scientific Advisory Group um, since July 2020. Um, I, I think uh, I usually sort of pronounce it ISAG, um, but I don't, I don't know how others are maybe ISAGE or something. Um, it's uh, an advisory group in Ireland pushing for uh, the containment of COVID. Um, she's a lifelong volunteer and activist um, uh, everywhere from 
adult literacy to trade union and political movements to personal support. Um, she's worked at the National University of Ireland in, in Galway for many years as an IT project manager, uh, recently retired, and now she's helping to, uh, to fight COVID in Ireland. So um, today she'll, she'll tell us a little bit about the story of ISAG um, on its road to trying to convince the Irish government to uh, adopt an elimination strategy. So uh, welcome, thank you for joining. Feel free to start when you're ready. Thanks, Derek. Thanks very much. And th hello, everybody. And greetings from Galway in the west of Ireland, which is where the little red arrow is pointing um, there on, a, on our logo. Um, before I start, just to say I'm going to tell a story. It's not a it's not a template. It's not a how to. It's not a lessons learned. It's just a story. But I hope there's something in it for you. Um, and um, I should also say thank you to Yanir for inviting me. He's been quite involved in our group and he comes to our 10 a.m. Monday morning calls, which is 5 a.m. for him. And he's a man who strangely seems to be available 24 hours a day for help. So it was really sad and really moving to see him earlier. He led a minute silence at the earlier session for all the people who died. And it, it was really, really moving. So um, how I got in, involved in, in this group. Um, so my eureka moment is I was listening to the radio one day last June and I heard a professor of infectious diseases uh, at an institution in Dublin saying crush the curve, which is what zero COVID was called at the time. And he said, if we crush the curve, we can open society up. And I said, well, this is the thing for me, definitely. Without knowing the details, it just made perfect sense. So I followed up, had a few conversations, and before I knew it really, I was um, on a couple of calls and the, the group then was formed. And I, I'll tell you a little bit about the history, early history of the group. Um, uh, so we started in, in, um, in all seriousness, really, in, in earnest in August. So the group has only been really working for five months, which really surprised me when, when I realized that because I think it's achieved an awful lot in that time. Um, so it's called the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group, and each of the first three words has great significance. So we're independent, we're not tied to any vested interests, we're scientific, so it's um, advocacy based or um, a, a evidence based group and advocacy rather than advisory because the government already has a public health advisory group and we didn't want to be in that space and be confused in that space. So very meaningful, took us a long time to cook it up, you know, a lot of thought went into it, but um, it really doesn't roll off the tongue very nicely, either in the long form, which, uh, you know, as it's written there, or ISAG, because ISAG sounds kind of awful. Um, so the PR people lately told us, you know, it's not very memorable, it doesn't sound very good, but nevertheless, we're stuck with it. So that's our group. Um, so a, a little bit of um, something about the characteristics of the group. The flat line at the top is, is our flat structure. I put a tiny little ellipse on the top of it just to say we do have a leader, not much discussed that we have a leader, but you know he leads by a kind of natural authority, but there is buckets of talent and leadership in, in the flat thin line. So the assets of the group from the start were science led, we're expert, we have a clear objective that I'll come to, very highly motivated, don't tire under pressure and very open, very open to all kinds of things, ideas, new members, etc. But there were a few deficits and communication skills were limited initially and um, really concentrated around media appearances and those were made as individuals not tied to the group because to start with we didn't have a group identity we didn't have a website and we didn't have a written plan so we had a bit of a journey to go at the start and the goal we set ourselves was you know a simple easy little goal persuade the government to adopt an elimination strategy we met some external challenges on the road to the goal um, and they did feel like this. They did feel a bit like a brick wall. Um, the first challenge really externally was the media. Very hard to get access to media. Um, and when we did get there, interviews that were given um, were really set up in a kind of an adversarial way, more for entertainment than for illumination. So we might, for example, be pitted against uh, somebody who believed in herd immunity. Then it's our turn to answer. We're slightly on the back foot. However, we have four media people and they've got very good at dealing with the media and very good at getting around those kind of things. Then those phrases, I was listening to Yanir earlier on and he said they're fatalistic and I agree with them. You know, we're not New Zealand. What about the border? We have an internal border on the island of Ireland. Um, you know, it can't be done. It's too difficult. 
uh, all of those kind of things. So they're, they're blocking rather than seeking solutions and they're kind of lazy really. Some of our group were called extremists in the early days and some of them I believe got some unpleasant emails in their inbox. The public didn't much want to hear about zero COVID or elimination and the government really didn't want to hear about it either. And just a word on our government, we had a general election in February 2020 um, and uh, but along came COVID later that month. And uh, so um, the government that had been there stayed on in a caretaker role and we didn't have a, a proper government formed until June. And it, most unusually, the two big parties, uh, lifelong rivals since the foundation of the state are in government together. So if you can imagine Labour and the Conservatives in government together in Britain or the Republicans and the Democrats together in the US, that's the kind of situation we have now. Um, and we have a small third party to, to make up the numbers. So it's not a marriage made in heaven. It's not a great place from which to govern during a pandemic. And it's possibly the reason why the government's strategy is called living with the virus. It offers no exit to get out and get up and running again, simply living with the virus. And that's what we've been doing. We're now in lockdown number three. Um, so we also had some internal challenges within the group. And this is really about behaviors. So some of our group uh, really do have an awful lot of autonomy in their professional lives. And there was just a little bit of uh, resistance to you know, the perception of management or structure. This colorfully chaotic photograph is a really good um, analogy for a, an editing process that went on when we were trying to put big, our big documents together. Everybody had an opinion, everybody gave their opinion. There were so many versions going around on email. So, you know, chaos really. Um, we, we had a tendency to go around in circles, either carrying themes from meeting to meeting, or, you know, to, to simply spend the, the whole meeting going around on a topic without anything agreed. And this is how the herded or unherded cats often felt at the end of meetings that went on for a long time. So in summary, we, we put some things in our own way. We stood in our own way. So how are we doing now? Have we held on to our assets? Have we, um, have we dealt with, with some of our deficits? And have we stepped up to our challenges? I think we have. So science is always going to be at the heart of, of our group and it stays there. But it turns out this is a group that learns really well. It learns how to do things better and it learns from its mistakes. And it's a wonderfully tenacious group and it hangs on sometimes by its, its fingernails. So starting at the top of the wheel, we do now have a written plan. Three people just went off, very simply wrote it quite quickly without the whole world having to edit. Um, it's called A Path to Normality and it's up on our website and I'll tell you about our website shortly. We have a wider skill base in addition to our scientists and our medics. We have someone from the world of law. We have um, a veritable army of data analysts. We have people from the arts and sciences. So the group is bigger, the skill base is bigger and it really all adds up to being more than the, the sum of its parts. Um, we've done really well in the whole external engagement um, sphere. We have built up good relations with the opposition parties in government. Um, we have built up good relations with business groups. And we've also reached out through our own networks, um, particularly on social media and other personal networks we might have. And through that route, uh, we got two very nice offers of uh, pro bono work in the communication sphere. And that sphere is now really well understood um, in the group. It's importance, it's necessity, really. All the science in the world is no good if you don't get your message out there to the people who need to hear it. So ISAG is now an entity. It's, it's got an identity and we present ourselves in that way. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. We are out there in the media and um, there's a late night current affairs program was on last night and um, one of our people was was speaking and um, my mother was talking to me afterwards and said did you see the name of your group was written underneath um Thomas ryan's name and i hadn't seen it but it's great that that does happen now we used to have to introduce ourselves and now the media are doing that on our behalf i mentioned our website so we have a sort of a serious website where we have our, our document, uh, who we are, uh, links to our YouTube videos, all of that kind of serious stuff. But you see there are um, very bright bubblegum colors there, the yellow and the pink that don't go really well with the pastel colors elsewhere in the wheel. And that's because we're, we're um, launching a new campaign called We Can Be Zero. 
And that's for the public to get involved. They can join a campaign. They can find out more. They can make a pledge for what they'll sacrifice now in order to gain something afterwards. And um, I think it's going to be a really, really nice initiative. And we're going to launch it on the 1st of January, um, 1st of February, excuse me, which is St. Bridget's Day and the 1st of spring in Ireland. So quite a significant day, a, a day of hope. And speaking of hope, it's we, we really would like to give the Irish public hope. And in order to have hope, it helps if you have agency, if you can act. And that's the thinking behind that website. It'll be fun. We hope to involve children and so on. So having gone all the way around the wheel and spoken about what's at the, the center of it, um, our meetings are now shorter. Um, we, we do an awful lot of work outside of the meetings and we turn up um, really to, re to review and to plan and to be in a space with like-minded people, which is so important. It's like a microcosm of, of what this group is doing. And we are much kinder to ourselves, which is very important. So I said that I would show you what I meant by ISAG as an entity. Late last year, we started uh, doing um, webinar, Zoom webinar style um, presentations, single topic presentations or press conferences. And this is what it looks like. So, you know, it's, as I said, the whole being more than the, the sum of the parts. Um, we have people here from Northern Ireland, the person I heard on the radio first, the person who brought me into the group, people from the social sciences. In the middle there with the, the man in the, in the middle with the earphones is Julian. He's our, a geographer and our border specialist, and he's going to lead on a very interesting topic on the border tomorrow, which is one of those fatalistic, it can't be done, it's impossible sort of topics uh, that we really need to face into if we're going to achieve zero COVID in Ireland. So. Do we have um, little green shoots of success? Have we overcome our challenges? What kind of impact have we had? Um, and are we closer to reaching that goal that I spoke about earlier on? Um, before I answer that question, I'll just show you this graph, which is sad, really. Um, coronavirus cases by month in Ireland from last February until the 14th of, of this month. And you can see pretty typical in Europe, we had a peak. And then we had the much lamented summer when we could have done something with our cases. And sadly, that didn't happen. So off we go again with the numbers up into another peak in October, back into lockdown number two. And then we come to, to early December. And the government, I think, made a very unwise decision at that point. They allowed hospitality and retail to open up. And they also gave permission to people to go to one another's houses at Christmas time. So up to three houses could, could visit together. And you can see the direct consequences of that. Um, our cases went from we're a population of 5 million people. And you can see there in early January, we peaked at over 8,000 cases. We went from being the best in Europe to having the worst infection rate in the world on that day. And that's just not a barometer. It's not just numbers. It's really dreadfully sad. There were deaths, there were, you know, our, our poor overstretched medical people um, in, an, in an ICU in a hospital situation that, that was already on a poor footing when we started this. So really very, very sad start to the year. I can tell you that things are much better now. We still have a long way to go. Um, but that was the, the, the situation um, for 2020 and early 2021. So to ask the question, um, have we made any inroads into our brick wall? And the answer is most definitely yes. And that partly comes from ourself, ourselves and our, our voice in the media, media and the fact that zero COVID is a word that's out there in, in the public domain, used by both those who really want it and those who don't want it, but it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Zero COVID is heard. And I actually heard it on our news headlines just before I came on the call. I don't think I need to say too much about time to you all. You all understand it. We thought we'd have this contained probably in, in 2020. Here we are in 2021. We're still full of uncertainty. And in the group, we too thought we were in for a sprint and we're in for a marathon. I certainly don't need to say anything to you about suffering. Just to say that whether it's individual suffering in all the myriad of ways that happens or um, economies being really adversely affected, it's all due to the virus. And if the virus is eliminated, so too is the suffering and we can get going again. 
in the political sphere um, very interestingly because I think largely of our connections with the opposition four opposition parties have come on board and without necessarily using elimination or zero COVID language they really have have come out in in favor of that position um, and as recently at the weekend uh, the second party and the biggest opposition party came out in favor so that is just fantastic um, the government is a little bit more interesting. Our, our um, vice um, prime minister, our deputy prime minister, was on the same late night current affairs program last night. Um, and our, the, the, present, the presenter of that program said, um, well, look, Tanish said, um, we've done two polls here of our viewers. The first is, um, are you, do you support mandatory hotel quarantining? And the answer was 96, 91% said they do. And that's actually been the case for a long time. And he said, yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, that's not very surprising. But the second question, which was more surprising, the answer was was very surprising, was um, would you take three more months in this lockdown if you thought it would be our last? And 77% of people said they would. And the Thonish just sat there in the studio and said, oh, oh, God, a bit taken aback, a bit surprised by that. So if I were the government, I'd be watching my voters and I'd be watching my popularity and I would not like to be where they find themselves now, which is behind public opinion. Um, so I, I think there will be a change around. And actually on the 6 p.m. news here this evening, the government has made a statement now, a policy change on mandatory quarantine. It's not clear what the regime is going to be. Is it going to be mandatory in hotels, which is what we're calling for, but at least there is a policy change and that is, is really, really favorable. So I would say um, after our five month journey and listening to what's going on now, success is coming. So we have gone as a group from that tiny little thing on the left, which is hardly more than a leaf to that much stronger shoot on the right. And I personally am quite hopeful. So I'll just leave you with this photograph and you might say, well, that's a fairly ordinary looking photograph. And, and it is really, it's my local beach. It's called Ladies Beach, about two kilometers from my house. Um, and it's looking across Galway Bay. Galway Bay is very famous for its sunsets but this is a sunrise and the photograph was taken two minutes to nine on the 1st of January. So it's a photograph of the first light of 2021. And I just offer it to everybody here as a symbol of hope. I spoke earlier about hope and having agency and we are all trying to do something in the whole world of coronavirus. So to all of you who are trying to do that, please take this photo um, as a symbol of hope. And uh, thank you so much for listening to me and I'm really looking forward to the presentations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead, that was great. Um, so we have about, about three minutes left for, uh, for questions. Um, I have some and then we also have some in the, uh, the group chat. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll take one from the, from the chat first. And it's, uh, it says, how did you rise to prominence as a new unknown group in media and, and to the government? A very good question. Um, mostly because of the people who took the media role. We always had four people in the media and they just persisted and pushed and pressed and wrote op-ed pieces. And when they couldn't have a satisfactory outing to lay out their, their, their own stall in interviews because of this adversarial thing I spoke about, they did the long form, they did podcasts and they pressed and they pushed. And they had great credibility. They clearly weren't associated with any interest. There was no money involved. They weren't politicians, they weren't journalists. And bit by bit, credibility really stuck with them. And, and I would say it's a small country of 5 million people. They're now household names. Thanks. Um, I have a, a question about, so I've seen all these like polling results from, from Ireland uh, and some of them that you were mentioning where like um, public opinion seems to be leaning fairly heavily towards like more restrictions and like yeah. less COVID. Yeah. Uh, why do you think there's this huge mismatch between like what the public wants and what the government does? That's a really good question, Derek. I really don't know. Um, it's not as in the case of some, you know, poor leadership in the world. It's not a case of malevolence. These are not incompetent people. I would say possibly a lack of imagination. Um, possibly staying too close to the business community who've been pushing their own agenda, staying with, with that kind of agenda for too long. 
but I, I don't think they'll be able to, to sustain that position. I do think they will need, I think there's a, a fairly big wave coming and I, I do think they will need to give in to that. Yeah. I see a very good question there. I can just take it. I saw it on the screen. Um, how much do the B117 variant contribute? Well, our Prime Minister, right, Tisha, according to him, it was absolutely the sole cause of the whole affair. Um, actually, it, this was proven to be not the case. It really had, had hardly had any impact at that time. And it was all down to too much socialising in December. And that's, that's proven at this stage. Did the, uh, the did the news of the new variant sort of change the uh, change the conversation a little bit? Uh, yes, I think it probably did. Um, people realized new variants were coming. They began to realize, oh my God, these things are coming. The more it's out there, the more these new strains are going to happen. And then the great white hope of the whole thing, of course, for for many of the public, is the vaccine. But are these vaccines that we have now going to be able to be effective against these new strains? So I think that whole conversation has really led to greater uncertainty, but it, it has also led people to think a little bit harder about things and about how to get out of the situation that we're in. Great. Well, uh, we're about out of time. Um, so um, thank you again. And uh, perhaps uh, if people have uh, more questions, we didn't get to them all. Um, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Can... I'll put my email address in, in the chat and I look forward to more interaction later. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Okay. So our next speaker is um, Elizabeth Semper. Um, Elizabeth is uh, one of the creators of COVID uh, Persistente España. Um, which is a, a long COVID group in Spain fighting for the rights of those um, suffering from long COVID. It's also a uh, support network which shares personal stories and of individuals suffering from the condition. Um, today, Elizabeth is, <clears throat> is here to tell us a bit about living with long COVID and advocating for others that, that might be suffering. Um, so, um, Elizabeth, feel free to uh, unmute and say hello when you're ready. Hello, um, I'm trying to share a presentation, sorry. Um, if I can, I don't know. This is, all right. Okay. Well. Living Long COVID, the Disease and Advocacy Impact by COVID Persistente España Association. Wuhan, Hubei, China, January 2020. China's government started Hubei's lockdown one year ago. How many of you thought it seemed like a dystopian movie? We all have these pictures in our memory. Meanwhile, in Spain, January 2020, we had any clue about that said coronavirus. First report it started in March. COVID Persistente España Association last report estimates SARS CoV 2 incidents in Spain at 2 million and a half officially reported cases. Our statistics suggest one third part above. It means long COVID holders will reach about 1 million cases within our frontiers, 3 million within a year, 30 million cases all over the world. I'm Elisa de Semper, 35 years old, mother of three little children, nowadays president of Asociación COVID Resistente España. I want to share my story with you, the story of thousands of others. I'm not sure how or when it started, let's say the 15th of February 2020, as the official beginning. My oldest son, five years old at that time, started having a high fever. He was feeling worse every day and I needed to get him to a dancer. Then I asked for a medical appointment. 
his fever was constant and he was feeling weak. My second son, two years old then, started with fever and vomiting four days after. He was definitely not okay at all. He was vomiting and fainting afterwards, absolutely scary. Two days he was awake, trying to get irritate himself, vomiting, fainting, getting slept again, fever peaks in between, and nothing else. I asked his doctor three days after when he was ready to move, and the doctor concluded it was just a virus, nothing to get worried about. That exact day, I was pretty cold, 34.9 Celsius degrees, the whole day. I went to work at my classroom to teach my then not recovered yet from just a virus students. And that night, I reached 39.2 Celsius degrees in four hours prior passing out. The next morning, I was happily surprised to be awake again due to the way I was feeling seven hours before. So I kept going on with my day, so throat and physical discomfort. My baby girl started her fever two days later. She was eight months old. When my oldest son went back to school, parents used to tell jokes about Corona. It was far away from us, wasn't it? Then it started the rumors of a possible lockdown while my son's classroom was doomed. 16 of 23 students were sick. My children weren't the COVID yet, but the basis is starting back routine as soon as possible, isn't it? National lockdown started four days after my second son became three. Against my relative's will, I canceled the party. A week later, my children started a mild cough, a little fever some days. I started two weeks later. Doctors only assisted us by phone. When I realized our COVID was getting worse, I needed three days straight to get a telephone appointment. By the time the COVID was incapacitating, we could not sleep at night. Due to our cough, I was not able to move freely. Used to walk bandit like a nail due to the stomach ache and chest pain. Helping myself with my house walls to get to the kitchen and to the toilet. Most of the time I was there, evacuating, I'm sorry for this, um, for hours, trying to clean my children's and my own constant liquid diarrhea. I needed to survive for 15 days drinking isotonic drinks as I was not able to swallow anything else than liquid, breathing between violent cuts, trying to barely cook rice for my children, who were sometimes as exhausted as I used to be. The pain was an agony. At night, I was day a day getting worse breathing crisis, so I was wondering which one would be my last. I was almost impossible to breastfeed my baby girl while coming. It became almost impossible to breathe while coming in general, so I decided to teach my oldest son to call the emergency number and two relatives of mine, just in case. I could not wake up again after passing out from a crisis. My children's skin was severely damaged. They used to cry about how it burned and hurt themselves. My own skin was eaten and breaking. My touch was compromised. My baby girl was crying in pain the whole day. Their legs hurt. My feet were like burning on a fire. My entire body was in pain. I broke my mouth by trainer. My teeth were moving the whole day. Biting a sausage was awful, impossible to bite a biscuit. My children were smelling wrong or just feces everywhere. There were not any laws or medicines, I swear. But at that time, my mouth became stale and I was not able to taste. I used to smell burning wires somewhere at home. My doctor tried with amoxicillin for 10 days for me and mucus were, was little reduced, but it was constantly desaturating between 88 and 92%. And it was all justified as anxiety 
because of the lockdown conditions. My children were not assisted at all. The pediatrician asked, I was inventing their symptoms. I was so hopeless, I even wondered if I were to be deaf at that point. I was so hopeless, I even wondered rather to be deaf, isn't it? Not only me, my friends were afraid. My relatives were worried for a thousand valid reasons and my children were getting accustomed to see me crying all day and all night long. I was convinced I was not surviving. So in case of a fatal landing, I promised myself not to leave my children's last memory on their mothers as a blue person facing her last days in pain. Then I realized that was not okay. I was abandoned at home, unable to care for myself. My children were doing their best, so did I. Then I started making more and more contacts, talking about and studying the illness, the medical papers, official publications, anything to my social study on SARS-CoV-2, sooner than I expected. We found out how important the disease was and the little studies were, and moreover, how hopeless and alone the patients were and how lost everyone was. There were few proven facts on long COVID then, but the coronavirus was evolving in my house and any other scientist would better describe any symptoms and signs of ours. Four months later, tests were finally released on private clinics and we were tested. Two of my children were IDD positive, IDM negative, and my always more affected son and I, IDD and IDM negative. Doctors and scientists were claiming our medical results as impossible to be. Our digestive, respiratory, neurologic, decoratory, and skin systems asserted the opposite. Our friends, relatives, and neighbor system symptoms were obvious as well. Same means treatment. Something else was obvious needed. It was mandatory to spread awareness. Almost a year later, this nightmare has not ended. Neurological symptoms have become the most incapacitating and horrific of all. My second son is almost four and getting more immunodeficient each month. My other two children are not under medical tracking. They don't remember how I was not being done, tired, or suddenly feeling physical pain. It seems like we could get better anyhow at some points, and we actually don't know. Our friends and relatives are each time more confused about reinfections or just the new lifestyle. People are afraid. And I am here to say, you are not alone. We want to help you out. We want to listen to you. We want to make a difference we did not have the chance to make in time for us. As an educational scientist myself, I wonder what would be the real consequences of this lifestyle. My children and those in the thousands more have had their lives split apart. They don't remember how I was living freely playing in the playground or regular sports. I don't still remember. We can see how terribly they refuse the new rooms needed. Check children's behavior, please. They are the most valuable players in here. Advocacy, it's mandatory to help people understand the reality. More than the strategies guiding the top professionals these days are here united to get lost hints. We know what they need to wonder. We are leading what they need to do get to guess first. Our reality is made of facts that we can give them to make their hypotheses and conclusions easier. The first who includes us advocates in their teamwork, trust me, the ones who reach out, the end line first. Covid Persistent de España Association understands your doubts, your fears, your pain, and it's willing to help. We don't only ask and demand, we take our illness and offer it for the best. 
we do need to offer them much more than words. On the basis, please take our vitamins, minerals, antibodies, hormones, slow viruses. It makes a difference. Take our way of talking, acting, feeling, not by providing us drugs just to take note on our evolution. See how our bodies are talking, please. Check the clinic of the patients. It's the only way of not leaving anyone behind. Tests are negatives for most of us on COVID holders. Please, I swear, pay special attention and treatment to children, young adults, and handicapped people. They need you the most. And we have almost any research for them. Be kind to us, please. We know how difficult life the generation can be. Listen to us. Maybe recognize you are lost in this, like we are. It's better being accompanied than abandoned and mistreated. Ask us patients for helping in the protocols needed for patient doctor treatment. We have fake to our experience. Tiny diagnosis is the most needed. Remember this, please. Time is up, scientists. Take your statistics and help us too. We had a life and we want it back. Listen to us. We listen to you and now it's your turn. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for your efforts and your improvements. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, thank you for all your, uh, your great work with this uh, long COVID group in Spain. Um, could you tell us a, a little bit more about that group? Like how many, how many people are active? How many people do you guys interact with? Um, we have uh, several platforms to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get back here. I don't know how to do, I'm sorry. Hmm. Well, we have more than 2,000 people in our, in our group. And we are all the time, every day in touch with them. They speak to us how they feel and how they are developing their illness and their lifestyle. And the number is growing all the time. Yeah, thank you. And um, I wonder, um, I think I, I have some links uh, to your groups. Um, I'll, uh, I'll put them in the chat in case anybody wants to sort of follow up, follow you guys on, uh, on, on social media, check out your website. Um, if there are any other like last questions, feel free to, uh, to put them in the chat. Um, if not, then um, we could follow up with Elizabeth uh, on Slack or um, on either of those links that, uh, that I just posted in the chat. Yeah, there's, there's one question in the chat that's just sort of like a general question about how harmful is COVID. And I, I wonder if um, you could talk a bit like, I, th I think people know that uh, it, there's sort of this like this risk of, of death, which sort of changes with age. But then there's this whole other thing that is less mentioned, which is which is long COVID. And uh, maybe you have some comments about that. So I, uh, I wonder, Elizabeth, um, yeah, what, what do you think about sort of the, uh, the risks of uh, death uh, or hospitalization versus like this long COVID thing? Like is long COVID probably like this bigger problem that, uh, that less people are paying attention to? Sure, it is. We estimate uh, more than 40% of COVID um, patients who develop some, some grade of long COVID. Uh, people is facing 
uh, health complications due to COVID, and they think those are sacred, but uh, we do know it's not only that that end in line to, to COVID. Most of us uh, are facing incapacitating lifestyle from that moment. Symptoms have not ended for most of us. And some people, it's getting better for a few months and then they go down and they think it's another disease. And it's pretty related to us. It's the same symptoms we, we are facing from the beginning. Thank you again, Elizabeth. Um, I think um, there, there's one last question in the chat about uh, whether or not your slides will be available. And I can sort of answer part of that. So we record this session and it'll be, that'll be up on YouTube. But um, if that person wants to sort of follow up with you and um, get these slides, how could they do that? Um, yeah, for sure. We have a um, website I'm sharing in the chat. And of course, our email, if you are willing to contact us, it would be a pleasure for us. Great. Thank you again, Elizabeth. Thanks to you. Okay. Our, uh, our next speaker. Um, let's see. We have two more before the break. Um, our next speaker is Roy Wilkes. Um, Roy is from uh, the group Zero COVID UK. Today, he'll tell us a little bit more about the uh, experience of building an activist-led grassroots Zero COVID campaign in the UK. Um, from my perspective, it's been really nice to watch the growth of this uh, relatively new group in the UK. So uh, thank you, Roy, for joining us. It's very nice to have you. Um, I'm Derek, and thanks for inviting me to this important conference, and thanks to the other contributors. Uh, we started recently, as Derek said, uh, in October, and we set up the campaign because although the scientists uh, of, M of Independence Age had been making a very powerful case for a zero COVID elimination strategy, nevertheless, they were being completely ignored. And the only opposition we were seeing on the streets were from the anti-lockdown, far-right, libertarian conspiracy theorists. And despite the fact that public opinion was shifting quite strongly uh, in favour of taking sensible measures to suppress the virus. So we, we set up the campaign to try and address this problem. And we are an un unapologetically political campaign. We understand that it is a political uh, crisis that's at the root of this. But now we are in the middle of a serious uh, catastrophe. Uh, a public health catastrophe and, and an economic catastrophe. Uh, we today passed 100,000 deaths in the UK, the worst in Europe, uh, per capita death rate higher than in the United States. Um, we've had over a thousand deaths per day for the past two weeks. And in addition, there's been a severe economic impact. The deficit for 2020 is projected to be 290 billion pounds, an astonishing uh, economic collapse, 80% higher than the G7 average. We've had uh, a, a loss of output 90% greater than the G7 average and 60% higher deaths. So there's been the corresponding worsening of the economic conditions for, 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 for many, many people. Uh, thrown out of their jobs at the same time as a as an unfolding public health catastrophe. And the question that Derek asked uh, Sinead earlier is an important one. Why? Why has this happened? And the simplest explanation is incompetence. But I don't buy that, uh, that, that Boris the Clown narrative. It's a sort of, that's what we're presented with. Uh, I don't buy it at all. And I think actually we do need to understand why this is happening. And I think there are two, three main reasons. Firstly, ideological, uh, because to respond adequately to a public health crisis, you need a, 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 com a communal response. There has to be a response of caring, of social solidarity. And yet in the UK for many years, 
We've had a, a dominant ideology which privileges the individualism, which tells us that there's no such thing as society. So to respond adequately to this crisis would cut in really against the, the dominant theme of the part of really since that since Margaret Thatcher's day. And the second explanation is political expediency, because um, the government knew, the establishment knew that going through Brexit, which is what we're doing now, would lead to a collapse in output. And I think it was expedient to be able to blame that on COVID, which, which they are now doing. Uh, Brexit's happening, it's destroying trade uh, in many ways, but it's being ignored because, because of COVID. And the, the third and most important reason for this catastrophe is systemic. And there's a little bit of a, a, a dilemma, a bit of a contradiction, because despite the economic figures that I've mentioned earlier, stock markets have been booming. It's been boom time since March in, in stock markets. The richest 10 individuals globally have seen their wealth grow by 400 billion pounds. That's enough to provide vaccine actually to every human being on the planet. Um, inequalities widen dramatically over the course of this pandemic. Um, so what's going on there? It just seems to be uh, somewhat contradictory. Uh, and how we can explain it is there's been a huge transfer of wealth, a huge transfer of money, of capital from the state, actually from state debt, the 390 billion pounds of debt that they've created into the corporations. And this has happened in many ways. Uh, private companies like Serco have been given £22 billion to set up a test and trace system, which is a global embarrassment. Uh, £14 billion on PPE, which failed to supply adequate PPE to the, uh, to the health services and so on and so forth. Uh, and a massive growth of, of state debt to furnish tax relief and subsidies directly to corporations. There's also another factor, which is that exhausting the NHS, which is what's happening now, to virtually the point of collapse, so the National Health Service uh, in Britain, we have a National Health Service, exhausting the National Health Service to the point of collapse uh, actually opens up the possibility for the privatisation, for the further privatisation of our National Health Service. And we know from 2019 that um, the, the secret documents were, were, were released, which showed that to get a trade deal with the United States, the many American um, uh, medical insurance and pharmace pharmaceutical companies were demanding full market access to the National Health Service. And we feel that collapsing the NHS, which is what's happening now, will actually open the door to that kind of uh, process. So it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, we're also seeing a, a, a massive propaganda offensive to blame the public for the catastrophe. Uh, rather than to blame government policy. Uh, so, for example, front page headline news recently was 400 people at a wedding. Shock horror. No mention of the 20 million people that are still having to go to work uh, in order to pay their bills. Uh, people who could be paid by the state to stay at home for long enough to suppress this virus. Um, there's a lot of pressure now to force the schools to reopen. Um, and parents are being dragged in to say how dreadful this situation is for them having to homeschool, how dreadful it is for the children and so on and such forth. And there's been a persistent claim throughout this pandemic that the public compliance would undermine any of the lockdowns. Actually, the public have been very compliant and I've followed the regulations uh, with one or two exceptions quite dramatically successfully. Um, and to some extent that's that's cut against the grain of the propaganda that we're seeing there's also a lot of propaganda around the vaccine this is being presented as a silver bullet that will free everything up the economy can fully open once the most vulnerable parts of the population have been vaccinated that's a very dangerous policy we feel uh, because it would allow the virus to continue to circulate there would be many more people suffering from long covid young people do die from covid as well but also the more they allow the virus to uh, circulate the bigger chance there is of further mutations and there could well be a further mutation which will end up being resistant to the virus so we're in a very dangerous situation uh, the entire media and establishments are trying to divert the blame away from the government and onto the general public. They're trying to build up pressure 
for uh, an anti-lockdown movement, uh, despite the fact that public opinion is, is pretty much strongly in favour of, of suppression measures. And we have to respond to this. And what should our response be? Well, our response is to build a mass movement in Britain to demand a zero COVID strategy. So we want an effective lockdown because we feel that an effective lockdown would be a shorter lockdown. It drags on for so long precisely because it is not effective. Uh, and that means the state paying workers to stay at home for long enough to suppress transmission. Um, it would cost a lot of money. Uh, you, but to pay 20 million workers uh, for um, 400 pounds a week for five weeks would cost 40 billion pounds. It's a fraction of what they've squandered, the 390 billion that they've squandered in 2020. And it's a fraction of what they will squander this year if they carry on with these on-off lockdowns, uh, damaging the economy as well as damaging public health. So we want a proper effective lockdown that will suppress transmission. We also want a local public sector system of find, test, trace, isolate and support uh, to replace the failed uh, corporate system, which we've got now at a huge cost. We've got local public health authorities that could deliver by recruiting local contact tracers, the sort of system that's worked so effectively in countries like Vietnam and China and uh, Taiwan and, and New Zealand. Um, and. Uh, we also need proper public health screening at all ports of entry with quarantine where necessary. So we want to build a movement that pushes through and popularizes the demands for these policies. Now, at the moment, we're only organizing online because we won't break the existing lockdown regulations, inadequate though they are. So we're having conferences, both national and local conferences and meetings. We are engaging in social media to try to win popular support for the zero COVID strategy. We're organizing local groups to send letters to their local papers, to get onto local radio stations, to write to their members of parliament, so on and such forth. We're building up the infrastructure of a movement uh, in uh, towns and cities right across the country, ready so that when the government does prematurely lift the lockdown, which it always does and which we expect it to do once again, ready to take to the streets in safe, fully masked, socially distanced and risk assessed uh, protest action so that we can give the other side of the story uh, to, in, in, uh, in opposition to the far right uh, anti-lockdown uh, demonstrations, which we've seen, which have been completely irresponsible, not masked, not socially distanced and so on. So we want to be ready to build up this kind of pressure. And uh, by building up that kind of popular uh, pressure, that kind of mass movement, uh, that will, we hope, have two impacts. Firstly, it will put direct pressure on the government to force them to change course. It will translate the passive support for effective lockdown measures into agency, into active protest. But as well, we hope that it will also have an indirect effect of giving workers the confidence to take action in their workplaces, to demand safe conditions, but also to demand that uh, non-essential work should close. And our National Education Union is an exemplar in this regard. Throughout the, the Christmas holidays, the government was insisting that schools must fully reopen on the 4th of January. Uh, on the 3rd of January, on the Sunday, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson went on national television to insist that the schools would reopen the following day and to tell parents that they had to send their, send their children to school. Also on the 3rd of January, the National Education Union uh, held an online meeting for its members, which 400,000 educators attended. We believe it to be the biggest union meeting in history, actually. 400,000 people attended. And the union members were advised to write to their head teachers to uh, invoke Section 44 of the Employment Act, which gives people the right not to work in unsafe conditions. Now, generally, that act was that put in place to, so that if you're in a burning building or something, you've got a right to leave it, or if your building's collapsing. However, they invoked this section, they told members to invoke this section of the Employment Act uh, on the grounds that schools at the time were not safe. And they were arguing not that they were unsafe, particularly to teachers and children, although there is an element of that, but they were arguing that schools were unsafe because the 
amount of viral transmission that was occurring in schools meant they were unsafe to the wider community. That children might not be getting seriously ill from COVID, but they were transmitting COVID, taking it back to their parents, their grandparents, and that was spreading it throughout the community. So they made this argument really of communal solidarity, of saying that they wanted to uh, ensure that, the, that schools that were not safe would only be open for the children of key workers and for vulnerable children, they weren't closed completely, but that they should be closed to the majority of children who should be homeschooled. And the teachers uh, did provide and have been providing uh, online learning for all the students since then. Now, as far as we're concerned, that was uh, an exemplar of how unions should actually treat this uh, pandemic as a, a public health crisis and how they should act in the interest not only of their own members but of the wider community and if our campaign can build a movement that can give other groups of workers the confidence to follow that national education union uh, example uh, and to collectively enforce uh, a, 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 um, a strategy to deal with the pandemic uh, to, re to replace the failed containment strategy of learning to live with the virus, then we feel that we have got a, a good chance of forcing the government to follow the example of New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, China, South Korea, and so on, uh, where they've successfully implemented a zero COVID strategy. So ours is a political campaign. It's a grassroots campaign of action, uh, of, um, uh, of protest, uh, in order to force that kind of change at the level of, of government, that level of political change. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. It was a good presentation. We've got probably plenty of questions. Um, I, I think the first that I'll take is from Sinead, um, and she's asking about what sort of impact you think you're having so far in the Zero COVID UK group. Um, well, it, it, as I say, we only we started in October with an initial meeting of a dozen people, and we've now got nearly a thousand members. We've got about well, we've got three national unions of affiliated. Several of the national unions are discussing and going through their processes for affiliation. A lot of local branches of unions and um, trades, what we call trades councils, local groups of unions uh, are affiliating. Uh, we've had online meetings of, uh, well, we had an online conference with 400 people participating um, just a couple of weeks ago. We've also, in alliance with several other groups who are campaigning for zero COVID and which the, what's called the Zero COVID Coalition held an online rally uh, on Sunday, which we believe 80,000 people at one time or another tuned into. So it, we, we are gaining, we're starting to gain some um, uh, traction. We're being ignored by the media. However, we know that uh, the, the people are starting to listen to the zero COVID message. We are, we are getting our message across at a kind of community level. And eventually we think the media are going to have to respond, especially when we move from online action to uh, actual outdoor protests, because by that stage, we believe that the movement will have grown sufficiently to, uh, to, to actually carry through outdoor protests, which will have an impact. And, but I would emphasize that we're looking for safe outdoor protest. That's great news. Um, I have a, a question. I wonder, is, is the term zero COVID uh, a popular thing in the UK? Or would, if you said that to most people, they'll not have any clue what you're talking about. Well, um, interestingly, when we first started, um, we had very small uh, groups of people with banners that said zero COVID, and we went and stood on street corners and things. And quite a few people confused us with the anti-lockdown movement, and uh, they <laughs> they got the wrong message completely. So we've, we've now put the subtitle, eliminate the virus. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's a term that's, that, that, that hasn't been widely known, but it is becoming more widely known and in, in, in fact, considerably so. And the, we have a, a, a national we, a television station which does a, a programme called Good Morning Britain. Very, very popular. Millions of people watch this. And the presenter 
said that we need a zero COVID strategy. Uh, gradually, that message is getting across. So I would say a few months ago, people didn't understand what we meant by zero COVID. Now I would say probably most people do. That's great news. That's, uh, that's really big progress, I think. Um, wh why do you think um, there isn't so much press coverage yet? And uh, what are your plans to sort of try to increase that other than the, uh, the protests? Um, well, again, we are um, organizing certainly at a local level to get people to write into newspapers because most local papers will print uh, uh, pay, uh, letters that the, the, the members of the public write into. We are continually um, sending our messages out there to the media. It is starting to filter through. Some uh, left-wing papers like the Morning Star have published extensive coverage of the campaign. Um, also, we have uh, we had an interview on RT News, um, which uh, it, it's starting to get out to the media, but it's, it's a slow process. Um, uh, eventually, we, 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 we would hope that they will have no choice but to report what's going on because the groundswell will be so significant. Great. So, so we're about out of time, but uh, thank you again, Roy. It's, it's been really nice to watch the progress in the Zero COVID UK group. It seems to be growing um, much quicker than, uh, than many of the other groups. And uh, it's, it's nice to see that progress. And I wonder, I don't know, uh, maybe for our last question, is, is this new variant uh, sort of helping you guys a little bit in terms of like messaging, saying like, okay, now there's this worse variant of COVID going around. Is this even more of a reason to go uh, go for zero? I don't, well, I, I mean, it's, it's part, uh, to some extent, but uh, but there's a, there's a slight problem with the new, the new uh, variant, the way that it's approached politically, which is the government uses the new variants as an excuse for the catastrophe that's involved. Everything is the new variant. Uh, nothing to do with the fact that they've had a completely inadequate strategy throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, we believe that we would be in the middle of a catastrophe now, even if there wasn't the new variant. So, you know, but I mean, it, 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 the fact that there are variants, I think helps us to get across the message that it's very dangerous to think that you can vaccinate 13 and a half million people and then fully open up the economy, because if we allow the virus to spread, there will be more uh, variants. In fact, it was put in the, the Financial Times, which is a, a, a serious establishment newspaper in Britain, the Financial Times published an article uh, today, which explains that um, the, the new variants are arising in countries like the UK, the US, Brazil, South Africa, which failed to suppress the first wave of the um, of the pandemic. There's no new variants arising in New Zealand or Vietnam. So we can make this argument that the current strategy is going to lead to further new variants. And those new variants, and this was, again, it's mentioned in the Financial Times, an establishment newspaper, these new variants um, may well end up being um, resistant to vaccines. And I think there's some concerns, I think, about the South African variant with some of the vaccines. So it is a very worrying situation. And you could end up that people who have been vaccinated could be at risk again. So, um, you know, we, we need to explain the science of it, definitely. And uh, the, the, the danger, the danger of allowing uh, uncontrolled transmission of the virus, which the government's putting us in. Great. Thank you again, Roy. It's, uh, it's good to see all the progress. Um, keep up the good work. Um, I'll, uh, I'll again post a link to the uh, Zero COVID UK website in the chat in case anybody wants to, uh, to follow up. And of course, um, as always, discuss it in the, uh, in the Slack. I didn't have a chance to get to all the questions. Um, our next speaker is uh, Desmond Algnoa. Um, uh, Desmond is from the Green Africa Youth Organization. Um, Green Africa Youth Organization is a youth-led, gender-balanced advocacy group which focuses largely on environmental sustainability and community development in, um, in Ghana. 
Um, today, De Desmond is going to tell us a bit about Ghana's COVID response, its, its early success in case, keeping cases very low, and the important role that community-led efforts might play in preventing future outbreaks. Uh, so Desmond, it's, it's very nice to have you. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, uh, a warm welcome to all the listeners. And I would like to comment on all the presentations before me. It's been really great learning from all the efforts across the globe. Um, can I share my screen, please? Okay, I do that right now. Okay. Um, This is showing. Okay, so as uh, Derek introduced, uh, my name is Desmond Alugna. I work with the Green Africa Youth Organization, uh, an organization I co-founded in a uh, few years ago. And uh, our, uh, we are based in Ghana, but then we also operate in other African countries. Um, my, um, I would be sharing some experiences from Ghana and uh, especially concentrating on how community-led efforts have uh, contributed some sort of a shield for, uh, the, uh, against the spread of the virus ever since the inception. Um, so, the first time Ghana recorded a case was on the 12th of March. And from there, there was kind of a panic across the country and people started to, to brace up and to, to, to kick against. But then it was immediately met with the government strict regulations, which was really commendable. Um, strict regulations at the border uh, zones and also constant communication by the president and also the, the, the initiate, uh, immediate lockdown, uh, strict lockdown um, to, to even though the cases were imported. And this lockdown had to, to after a month, after two months, the situation became, became quite problematic because those of you who have fair knowledge about Ghana is highly informal and a lot of activities um, and daily life depend on how many uh, or daily activities that you have been able to, to, to do. And so people going into lockdown mean that some might not even get to feed after a few days. And so it was quite uh, problematic. But then government provided some relief services, uh, including um, free utility among others. Um, so after three months, when we went into complete lockdown, we had we have 16 regions, 16 states, I would say, in the country. And we, as a, after three months, we still have cases only in, um, in four of these regions, and only two were actually having a lot of cases. The rest were really having nothing, only few cases that they had and they are managing. And the reason was that there was constant communication and there was a community effort to, to, to keeping these people isolated and managing them. Why we couldn't have zero cases as at that time was also the fact that as time uh, goes on, there were people that were continuously being discovered because the first case uh, was an imported case and this person had traveled from the south to the north after arriving from uh, Norway and then another from Turkey. And so these had uh, infected others that the contact tracing kept on covering, but then because they were already there, the, the word of mouth had made a lot of people very cautious. They were not spreading more, but these people that are already in contact were also having the, the virus. But significant to this was the work of uh, communities. Uh, traditional authorities, local communities, uh, civil society organizations, where my organization comes in. What we did was to facilitate intercommunity learning, whereby there was a massive uh, 
um, support in providing, uh, making local nose masks because that was the first problem. PPEs were very difficult to come by. Some were coming from China, but this wasn't enough and it was quite expensive also at the beginning. So local communities and NGOs like my own, we started to make, uh, improvise and make locally produced masks hand sanitizers and all other things. But significant in the tracking was also that we were also making sure that we, we, we helped traditional authorities to establish some invisible borders, whereby they are able to, to phone and tell uh, and communicate when there is a new person that moved from city or moved from another place into a particular community. And once these communities are sort of demarcated just by the, 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 the contacts we have with people, it also helped that immediately there was a new person or there was a new case or somebody showing some sort of symptoms that it was easy for them to, to, to um, report and to communicate with the health authorities. And this also eased, uh, eased the, 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 the issue of the fear and the stigmatization because at the beginning, those who got it and then those who have been uh, uh, taken into isolation by, by way of contact tracing, even though they had not shown symptoms, already created some kind of panic and people started to stigmatize and people didn't also have the courage to, to talk about it when somebody is not feeling well. So the penetration of civil society organizations like uh, Green Africa Youth Organization started to, to unease this tension and to make people feel, feel uh, understand that it was needed, that, that immediately you don't feel well, whether it is normal headache or it is fever, you have to report and then the health facilities would uh, do a terror check. We were also playing another role, which is more of uh, stock taking and 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 reinforming the public, which is something we still do even as at now, because we encourage people to do text messaging, to to do word of mouth, to walk to the nearest radio station, to complain and all and all that. But then we also uh, are people who are made up of so many young people, ad advocates and activists. So we read about success stories of other countries. And then we try to put this in a simplistic way, whereby we, 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 we look at the local scenarios and what are the measures that these countries have done that have supported them? How do we put these measures in a local perspective that people can, can understand and, 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 and then appreciate uh, the, the, the protocols? That, that uh, helped, and so until we until September, from March until uh, October, actually, we had really uh, low cases uh, a, a day. We, we would have a maximum of um, sometimes twelve cases, and sometimes uh, very less cases. Um, then in it, along the way of course ghana we had an, an a general election in december uh, december 7th and then apart from the general election december is a very festive season for for the country it is the, the, the it is the month that people have to celebrate different festivities farmers had already um, harvested crops and so that is normally a season that people like outdoor activities and also in a uh, 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 because these numbers were also pretty low, because government thought um, they have arrested it, they were they begin to relax the measures. So government begin to to relax measures, uh, and, and and then people begin to to actually take things for granted. And of course, government had elections to conduct, and so the focus also had to 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 be more on the elections. And this. You would see so many people at rallies, you very crowded and sometimes no mask, no distancing, social distancing. And people started also to organize their own parties and other things. And now after those things, uh, after December and then first week of January, we started to see a, a high um, a spike in, in, in the number of cases. And now we record, um, over 300 cases on, on daily basis. And it, cumulatively, we have so many um, high numbers that I would be showing you in the next slide. 
And this is now creating a problem because even now, um, um, two, three days ago, the, the director of health actually confirmed that a new variant has also been um, discovered and it has similarities with the South African one and also the, 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 the one in the UK, which is quite alarming and which is very, uh, which um, you can blame on, on not only on the, the communities um, becoming adamant, but particularly on government uh, behavior. Um, so I would come back to this. Are communities still building their resilience? As I already said, that part of the government success was practically the effort of self-initiated community rules that they were able to create these invisible boundaries to guide their borders. And at this point where government effort uh, seemed to, to becoming very mild, are these communities still being able to, to hold to uh, their words? And I want to quickly show you this. So as I was saying, this is the, the, how the CAF currently look like. So you see that from the, the, the beginning when it's, it hiked somewhere in uh, July, August, we had a very stable line, just trying to manage the internal ones. And at this point, borders were, internal borders in the country were actually also closed. So from region to region, you pass through a number of tests before you actually get to your home. If you want to cross from one part of the country to another part, you are not crossing um, a fiscal board, uh, border like water or sea, but then the buses that you take, they have to do a series of tests. They have to ensure that you are definitely good to go before you go to another place. So these were creating these isolations, keeping people away from the hot zones, and then making sure that those who are contact, who had contact with um, COVID cases and those who were infected were kept also in isolation to manage. Unfortunately, you realize that somewhere in December, as this curve is showing, the spike came. Um, and that is owing to the explanation I gave that festive seasons in addition to a general election where people uh, practically uh, took things for granted. So at the point, at this point, the I'm coming back to this particular part where community efforts are. Communities have also relaxed because now there are a lot of, uh, unfortunately, um, 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 superstitious uh, sayings uh, by religious groups and other people who, who, who are saying that COVID is really uh, nothing. It's, it's either they are saying it's a, a rich man disease or they are saying that it is, um, it is, it is a spiritual thing and you just have to start uh, to pray and then kick against it. And these things are getting a kind of penetrating and making the earlier understanding that community had and the fear that community had, communities had kind of go away. And so our call to action at the moment, what we're doing is that we are reinforcing the community borders. We are reinforming people, um, giving them the numbers, giving them the situation, showing them the, the imagery of, of how people who do not take measures seriously end up in uh, 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 relying on a ventilator or end up actually dying. And we have, um, we, we, we had, we have currently quite um, a surge also in the, in the mortality. So all these months until October, the, 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 the cumulative numbers of, of that were actually below 200 people. And now within this period of uh, two weeks in January, we are talking about 375 78 uh, uh, people that that have that have uh, that have passed in cumulatively, and so this is also another thing that we are we, we are we are using to we are we are using to tell communities that you have to you this is 
evidence. And, and, and these are not just um, rich people who are dying. They are not just old people. They are a mixture of people. And you do not know who has underlying uh, health conditions. And of course, our health con um, uh, insurance and other things are not really that of up to standard. So we're trying to let people understand and sort of re re revisit the, the fear that, that made them to, under to, to believe that avoidance was the, 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 the main solution. Can we create those borders again? Can we make those, those, those uh, traditional authorities and local communities take the, the, the law, take the, the, their lives into their own hands and protect themselves, whether government is uh, supportive or not? This is something that we are trying to, to, to prove, but um, it's quite difficult because it's also, these are things that you, you as, as civil society groups, one thing that you don't have obviously is, 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 is the decision-making power, but you can influence. You can always make your impact through influencing and creating awareness. The other thing that limits you is obviously the, the, the resources, the resources that you need to, to make sure that you achieve or you go beyond the, your immediate reach, which is also another, another uh, challenge. But then uh, regardless, we are trying to expand our network and uh, work with our youth uh, uh, NGO partners that we already in partnership with. Um, I'm gonna end here. Um, this is just a brief about uh, Green Africa Youth Organization. So if you want to know more, you can just visit greenafricayouthorganization.com and then you would, um, you, would, you would read more about us. Um, in that case, I say, can't wait to, to, to be able to greet this way again. Thank you. Thanks, Desmond. A, a very nice talk. Um, it, it's sort of rare that, uh, that we get to hear from um, a lot of African leaders of different organizations. So it's, it's nice and it's interesting to sort of hear those stories. There was one question in the chat about um, whether or not Ghana had some previous exper experience with um, pandemic or epidemic outbreaks like Ebola or something like that. Do you know anything about that? Um, in recent years, no. Um, we were prepared for Ebola because Ebola was becoming, uh, um, it got to our neighboring countries. And it's, it's very easy that you walk uh, from one country into the other. So we were prepared. We, we started to create uh, isolation centers, but fortunately it didn't get in. So um, by way of that preparation, yes, but we didn't have that encounter whereby um, actually it is now that we have um, through this COVID that we set up infectious disease center. Uh, but previously we, 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 we didn't have that, uh, this kind of head on encounter with this uh, Ebola. I see. I wonder, so we heard from uh, people in Ireland and the UK, how like the community really like wants this really strong action, but the government um, is sort of slow or very hesitant to, to take that action. In, in Ghana, is, is there the same sort of feeling where like the community wants one thing and then the government does another? In Ghana, it, it, at the beginning, it was, it was mutual, mutual uh, interest. It was mutual interest and government was really uh, on top of, of the issue. And in fact, at a point, there was also agitation that people couldn't uh, handle the lockdown anymore. But then, um, like I said, sometimes um, there has been a controversy uh, as to government saying that uh, it is not really about the elections. It is about people not obeying the rules and having parties, but also uh, civil society and then the, the communities also believe that, no, that is not true because government wanted to have uh, 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 people to come out to vote, they just relax the measures and you see parties, uh, you see uh, uh, party rallies and all the big time, uh, the, the politicians are there and they are not really obeying the, the rules. And that influences a lot of people. And, and that is where the turning point 
uh, hit. After, after, when they started doing the, the campaigns, community realized that, okay, government is not really here for us. Government is there for, for something else. And, and in this case, the, 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 those who, who, are, who are already um, having doubts, those who are already hearing conspiracy theories that um, this is evil uh, upon, upon you and, and if, you, if you have to, if, you, if it is not a reality, they begin to also relax their guard. And, and I think that is where we, we started to feel that government is doing something else and the people are doing something else. So for example, at the moment, all schools have reopened in January, second week of January when government already having gone through all these elections, having ex ex heard the news that a second wave was coming, having heard the warnings from health aspect that a second wave was coming regardless, schools have now op reopened and they are asked to go back to school and a lot of them are already complaining that they do not, they did not give them PPEs and parents could not provide enough. So that should tell you that the, 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 the efforts are not, uh, are not going in the same direction at the moment. It's, it's like um, government efforts are rather lagging. Thanks, and we're almost out of time, but I have one more question for you. I, I know in most African countries, vaccinations have not started yet, but I, I'm wondering if in Ghana, people are even like talking about it yet. Are, are people talking about vaccinations? Yes, Derek, people are talking about vaccinations. And it's one point that Green Africa Youth Organization is also trying to diffuse, to tell people that do not put your, your, your hope on vaccination. The effort to, to eliminate is, is, is the key thing here because one, the, the more the virus is in the system, the more it has the potential of replicating and becoming something else. And so Ghana as as we know ourselves, we know that no matter how proven and efficient a vaccine is, before we would have it, before we have access and before we have enough of it for everyone, it would have been that wealthier countries have been able to vaccinate all their citizens or significant amount of their uh, number of their citizens before we would have access to it because we do not even have enough funding for, 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 for the vaccines. And so we, we are trying to let people know that relying on the vaccines should be a secondary thing. The first focus should be, how do I make sure that COVID gets out of Ghana even by the time that we have access to the vaccinations? The president had uh, told the, 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 the public that first quarter of the, the year, we would have uh, procured vaccinations. But um, unfortunately, um, that doesn't look realistic now. And already the um, health uh, aspects have also uh, um, made mention that the earliest, if that is even possible for, for the country to be able to afford would be the ending of June. And so that doesn't really give hope that we're gonna get vaccines soon. Even though there was a committee that was also set to actually come out with uh, to advise the government on which of the vaccines that have been talked about that would be probably good for the country to procure, and they recently um, have come come back with their report, which we are yet to hear the details. But that still the point is that uh, people are, are are talking about it, but we are telling people also not to really rely on the vaccines. Great. Thank you again, Desmond. And your advice seems like perfect to me. I, I think I think you're doing all the right things. And so I, I hope you keep up the, uh, the good work. OK, so um, thank you, Desmond. Next, um, we have a, a, a very short break. Um, so we're scheduled to, uh, to start the next talk at uh, 15 past the hour. So how about we take a two minute break and then um, after that, I'll, uh, yeah, it's a very short break. You can uh, maybe run to the bathroom if you go fast. Um, but anyway, thank you again for the, the speakers in this first half of the session. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the next one.
Thanks for the great talk, Desmond. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> so I am wondering, I hope our other presenters come back for this next session. No, it was great to hear the whole story of everything that you've been doing over there and at the how to handle it. It's a really, it's easy for us to forget, you know, we're all, we're on the other side of the world over here. So it's wonderful to know that um, the struggles are universal, aren't they? Yeah. Arvind yeah. Peterson did speak at other time slot on Thursday. Okay. At any time slot, I mean, at any of the available time slots. That's what I've meant, sorry, typo. Okay, can you ask her to email me? Uh, what should I, I mean, what do you want me to just do email awesome. intro? Get in touch with Kim, she can help with coordination. Okay, we'll do. Because yeah. otherwise I'll, I'll forget to reach out, I think. Sarah, do you know if our next speaker, Joaquin, is here yet? I personally have not seen him. And I have been making attempts to contact him. I don't have a phone number for Joaquin, but I messaged him. I sent him an email and I um, asked our colleagues uh, in the staff only channel if they could try to find him. <laughs> I know it sounds silly. Try to find him. <laughs> He's missing. We may have to adjust the agenda. Um, do you happen to have his phone number, Derek? I don't. Um, I was in touch with him uh, on Slack a little while ago, just sort of. Um, Tara has his number. Confirming the time. I know. I do not have his phone number. <laughs> I was going to say, oh. I had no idea you guys were so close. Well, no, I thought you guys had texted about, about some design stuff. Uh, yeah, I got no. one. He's on the way. Oh, great. Oh, hey, name's Gary. <laughs> there is a voice I have not heard in forever, at least. <laughs> nice to see you. Tyson, if you're in the room, I think you sent me a direct message earlier and I was I was occupied and I missed it. Now I can't find it. To, uh, to work with him for several months now. Um, he's the creator of um, Speak Up America, which is a, a service that quickly connects you straight to your elected representatives uh, to give them some message. Uh, he's also uh, the creator of the Green Zone Act, which is a national plan proposed to help stop the spread of the pandemic in the US. So um, welcome, Joaquin, and uh, the floor is yours when you're ready. Cool. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to work with you as well. Um, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, OK, so I'm going to uh, put together a presentation for everyone. So let me go ahead and get that going. Okay, everyone can see that? <clears throat> yep, looks good. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Uh, well, it is a pleasure to be here um, with everyone. Um, yeah, to be here with uh, so many great people that have been doing amazing work uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, obviously, um, you know, this year has felt like, you know, maybe a decade. Um, and and that's because you know we've been trying so hard um, to to really uh, turn things around. And so um, 
like Derek mentioned, uh, I've been here um, uh, since last year, um, I believe March. Um, and you know, my uh, my goal when I came on board uh, was just you know to leverage my background in in advocacy and politics, um, and um, you know help, help empower this community um, to um, influence policymakers. Um, to create um, policies that would, um, you know, uh, suppress the virus um, and end this pandemic. So, uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, so, my background is in advocacy. It's in politics. Um, I've worked in uh, on a couple of uh, presidential campaigns. Uh, most recently, uh, the Biden Harris campaign as well. Um, I've also um, been part of. Um, advocacy in higher education um, in the CSU, um, as well as economic development um, under the uh, Small Business Administration. Um, and I've done work in public affairs too uh, with uh, the Coral Fellowship um, and, um, and several other organizations. Um, and I'm also involved in um, uh, the local NPR station um, as a vice chair for their regional advisory council. Um, so, um, so I, I'll share with you all a little overview of this talk. Um, it's been, it's been sort of a journey. And, and so I'll kind of, um, um, you know, uh, guide you through the journey, um, I I've been on and, um, and how it's evolved towards a, a green zone act. So, uh, we'll cover, you know, the concept of change, um, the different ways that can happen. Um, we'll cover the work uh, that's been done on advocacy uh, with ncoronavirus.org, um, and then also um, a Green Zone Act, okay? And then at the end, um, how we can all take action. So, all right, so change. Um, you know, the great thing about change is that there's a lot of ways to create change, right? Um, and so, you know, some of these ways, um, you know, different people feel comfortable um, with, with one way over the other, uh, different people are um, more capable in, in cer certain areas um, and, and have talents that they could lend, um, right? So, so on one end, you have advocacy, right? Um, you, have, um, you have education uh, where you can you know, share information, share, share videos, um, um, coalition building, right? Where you work with, uh, a lot of groups and and build common ground um, and and leverage each other's voices uh, to create um, bigger influence. Technology, right? Um, there's a lot of technology that could be leveraged to create change. Uh, technology itself um, can be change, right? As we've seen uh, with the advent of Facebook and Twitter and the influence that has um, on our um, civic life. Uh, public relations, right? Um, you know, getting a message across there. Um, helping to shape a narrative, um, civil di disobedience. We've seen this uh, throughout history um, that civil disobedience um, can really influence the outcome of, of policy and changes culturally. Um, and of course, lobbying, uh, the, the formal definition of lobbying, uh, going to policymakers um, and putting all those resources uh, in order to enact laws. So, um, so at end coronavirus, um, you know, we've touched on, on different parts of this. Um, in my work, um, you know, I, I'll show you a sort of um, how we touched on advocacy, education, uh, coalition building technology, um, and probably a little bit of the other ones too. So, um, so as Eric mentioned earlier on, um, you know, one way um, is to uh, do advocacy, right? And so, um, so I have a platform called Speak Up America. It's at gospeakupamerica.com. And so I originally had it just for Alexa. Um, and I saw that um, putting it on the web would be a lot easier and helpful for the work um, that we were trying to do at that time um, for ncoronavirus.org. So, um, so I built a web presence um, and made it so that um, we could get our message across to policymakers. Um, so whether it's governors, 
uh, Congress, mayors. Um, we've also added um, for specific regions, South Carolina, Virginia, um, you can uh, automatically be connected to their office um, and also receive a, a script by text message um, that, that helps you on the call, right? Uh, and, you know, we have the general uh, green zone script on there, uh, but also, you know, during different times of this pandemic, um, different things have, um, you know, um, been really important to emphasize. So uh, safe school reopenings is one uh, additional custom script um, and rapid test is another script. So, okay. Um, another thing was, um, you know, that's part of advocacy and it's also on education. Um, it's, you know, getting that message out there, right? Um, in many ways, um, you know, this is one of the easiest things that governments could have done, right? It's just at the beginning, share information early on, right? Make sure that people have clarity on what's going on. Um, make sure that any questions um, that they have are answered, right? And so, you know, in, in seeing the importance of that, uh, we put out videos, um, right? Covering virology um, with uh, Dr. J Jeremy Rossman, um, who's on you know uh, several of the panels, I believe, um, during this conference, um, and an organizer for the conference as well, um, and um, covering green zones uh, with Yanir, covering economics, um, covering the how to win strategy as well, um, and just getting that information out there and making it accessible. Um, these videos were super short, very much to the point. Um, right, let's get it out there um, and, and have people, um, you know, uh, have more information uh, so that they can themselves be empowered. Okay, um, and also uh, advocacy training, right? So, you know, as part of our goal is, okay, we have to get the attention of, of lawmakers, of, um, you know, of legislators, um, but then at the same time, how do you do that, right? okay, you call them, right? And, and you tell them, but can we take it a step further, right? Uh, can we have meetings with them? Can, can we help them, um, you know, uh, bring um, policies to the table that are favorable towards ending the pandemic, right? And so um, I won't go through the training right now, but you, you can find it online. Um, if you look up uh, ncoronavirus.org, uh, advocacy training, um, and, and we cover all these, uh, different areas on on how to set up a meeting, um, how to have an effective meeting uh, with lawmaker, lawmakers, um, and making sure that um, you have continuity in that process. Um, you know, and uh, you know, shout out to uh, Briggs Klinko uh, who participated in these um, in these trainings early on, um, and you know, uh, who went off and, and did great work in uh, in in Arizona um, with the mayor's office and, and, and community building there. Um, so that's available as, as a resource um, if you want to uh, take advantage of that. Um, okay, so now, right? Um, so now, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're about a year now, right? Uh, since the pandemic started. And, um, you know, at the beginning, um, everyone who's working on it has a vision, right? It's like, um, we do not, we want to contain the pandemic because if we don't, eventually we're gonna get to, um, you know, um, 10,000 10, deaths, right? Um, okay, we, we hit that milestone. Um, all right, uh, uh, 60,000 deaths, right? I think that was like one benchmark the government put out, right? We, we hit that, uh, 100,000 deaths, right? Um, and every step along the way, we're like, what is going on? right? We were supposed to end this months ago. Um, and now we're at over 400,000 deaths, right? That is monstrous. That is crazy that we're at this point. Um, and, and, it's, and it's continuing to build, right? And so, um, so a, a Green Zone Act really is um, going to the heart of the matter, right? It's presenting a framework for federal legislation to end community transmission of the pandemic, right? Um, and that is by taking a comprehensive approach, right? By making sure that every 
part that needs to be addressed so that people can uh, protect themselves, so that people can be financially supported, and that there's active communication with uh, the community, uh, and both ways, between the government and the community, um, so that resources are allocated um, in, in the best way possible. Um, that, that is what it's going to take um, to end this pandemic, right? You have to cover every part. Um, and, and, you know, we empower ourselves, right? And, and it's quick to take that type of action. Uh, government, it's slower, but government, if you picture it, it's like two trains heading in the same direction, right? And, and one has a, a, a low load, right? And so it's able to get there quicker. The government one has a, a huge load, right? But, you know, they have a lot of resources, right? And they can create change in, in a big way, right? Unfortunately, this big load makes that train take longer to get to that same destination. But we need it to get to that destination in order to bring those resources to help us, right? To make sure that we're able to help ourselves in the best way possible, right? And so, uh, so that's what this is. Um, you know, uh, other countries have proven that it can be done, right? New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, Vietnam, Singapore, right? Um, you know, the United States being one of the most, if not the wealthiest country in the world, right? Argu arguably the most powerful, right? There is no reason that this shouldn't be able to be done in the United States, right? Um, you know, we, we, uh, all the science is out there, the models are, are out there, um, the only thing that's missing is the will, right? The, the political will to make it happen, right? And so you can find the framework at greenzoneact.com um, where um, you can um, check out um, protection protocols, financial foundation, community care, um, and, and also, um, you know, uh, sign as a supporter as well. Um, so, you know, it was launched about um, December, mid-December. Um, so in the first month, uh, you know, what has happened? Um, so, you know, um, it was forwarded to a, uh, so I forwarded it to a COVID task force member um, and that COVID task force member uh, forwarded it to the Biden-Harris transition team. Um, we've also gained a lot of community support um, and, you know, from, from from scientists, from, from doctors, um, from, from teachers, you know, professors, um, from musicians, from, um, you know, across the board. Um, so you can find that um, under supporters um, on the website as well. Um, and it's also been circulated through Congress, right? And we're continuing to do that. So, um, so now, um, what can we do now? Right. So uh, if you've shown your support for a Green Zone Act, uh, thank you so much. If you'd like to, uh, please go to greenzoneact.com. Um, you know, you can call and write your congressperson, right, uh, to support a Green Zone Act. Um, and I'm happy uh, to help you with that process as well. Um, share with your community members, right, who want to get involved and believe something like this is important. Um, and you can follow us on, on social media as well um, at, uh, at Green Zone Act now. Um, and, and that's it. Uh, let's pass a Green Zone Act. Um, so thank you all. I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, you know, I'm happy to be a resource for anyone. Um, and, and thank you again for your time. Thanks, Joaquin. A, a, a great talk. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have any time right now for questions, but if anybody wants to reach out to Joaquin, there are sort of a couple of ways to do it. I mean, you can message him on, on, um, on Slack or uh, you might hang around and uh, stay in this Zoom room to uh, talk in the chat a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I'll hang out. Great, yeah, Joaquin is sort of always available. I don't know if he's taken like a full day off since like March of last year. Perhaps. No. No. <laughs> I've gone into nature though. That's my favorite. So that that's been helpful throughout the days. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you, Joaquin. Uh, thank you, Derek.
Okay, uh, next up we have Tyson Bellinger. Um, Tyson is the owner and director of Shady Oaks Assisted Living. Uh, prior to buying his family's home and moving in next door, uh, Tyson graduated from Yale in 1998, served three tours in Iraq as a Marine infantry officer, and then went on to uh, earn a PhD at Harvard in 2014. Uh, Today, Tyson will share um, his four best precautions against COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. Um, one note before I, I let Tyson begin, um, Tyson's been featured in sort of many media outlets because of his successful strategies in protecting his residents during the pandemic. Um, it includes the, the New York Times and MSNBC, and um, probably the most impressive is the Hall of Fame webpage on endcoronavirus.org, where we, we put him on there a while ago. Um, so Tyson, it's uh, it's very good to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Okay, feel free to begin. All right, I'm gonna try to do a PowerPoint presentation. And the first step I think is to share the screen. Oh, there we go. How does that look? Can Looks you perfect. See? You can see the, uh, uh, the, the first page. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, this is the first time I presented by PowerPoint. So please forgive me if something goes awry. Uh, this is uh, new. There we go. All right, so uh, the presentation today is tips from a care home. My name is Tyson Blanger. I'm the owner and director of Shady Oaks Assisted Living. I'm a three-tour Marine Iraq veteran. I got a BA from Yale and a Harvard PhD. That's my contact information. Today, I wanna to talk to you about Shady Oaks, what it is, what, what, it, like, what is this place that we were able to keep safe from COVID and to share four tips, our bubble, our testing procedures, KN95s and purifiers, and then talk about a milestone we, we recently reached. Shady Oaks is a small home. It's an assisted living home, it has just 32 residents. It usually gets up to about 40, but our census has been dropping as people are more reluctant to come to home care, uh, homes of any kind, including ours. Our goal is to be an alternative to a nursing home. Our goal is to be cozy. It's not fancy, but it's cozy. And we're very high care. About 70% of our residents use wheelchairs. So if they weren't here, they'd probably be in a nursing home. Our level of care is like nursing home level of care. I'm very proud of my parents. They're the ones who came up with the idea of doing this and they worked very, very hard. My life has been very different. So I, I graduated from high 94. I graduated Yale in 98. I've always been around Shady Oaks but never really got really involved. Uh, that's my platoon when we made it to Baghdad, a proud moment as a Marine uh, officer. And this is a proud moment from graduating from Harvard. And you can see that just as I was graduating from Harvard, my, especially my father, you can see it in this picture. He's not his health was on the decline. And it was this question of what was going to happen to Shady Oaks going forward. I bought Shady Oaks, I moved in next door and I committed to doing my best for my residents just as I would for my own family members. I'd actually had two of my grandmothers live here. Uh, my, both of them had lived here and 11 of my family members that live here. We had a really fun, loving home. And then we saw the news about Kirkland and it scared us to death. And scared me to death. I began having nightmares at night and like they have been throughout the entire year only recently to sort of let up a little bit. When we saw that Kirkland was suffering the way that they were suffering, it felt like the residents were trapped inside. They were quarantined inside a, 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 like a nursing home that would likely kill them. And I was so afraid that this would be what would happen to our home. So I racked my brain. Uh, the first thing we did was we set up a checkpoint and we tried to monitor temperatures, but then I kept hearing about this thing called asymptomatic transmission and presymptomatic transmission. And I stood that checkpoint and I tried to take people's temperatures and I was just I was so frustrated. I just couldn't, there was just no way that it was going to work over the long term, especially with the kind of numbers that they were talking about, the prevalence of COVID that would come through the surge. So the big idea was that we needed to buy time. And I've been through this a couple of times in my life as I've been at places where 
things were in rapid change and sort of, you just need to make it through your first couple patrols. You just need to make it through your first couple experiences so you can learn something. We need to buy time. The best way to buy time was to pay our staff to come on board and to stay with us uh, for two months. We were able to talk enough people into it. Uh, we were able to buy trailers. I own the house next door. I moved out of it. I gave it up to my staff. I moved into my office and slept on the floor. The biggest constraint, the biggest challenge of the bubble at first was money. But fortunately, I've been blessed with doing well for myself on the stock market and with what means I had had. And I was willing to commit it all and put it all in, sink it all in for this good cause and what it meant to save our home. The next challenge was housing. So again, we had to buy the trailers and we had to step out. I had to leave my own home to, to be able to provide the space for it. Another challenge as time went by was complacency. So there was sort of this euphoria when we were inside the bubble of what it was like to be free and secure and safe and away from uh, COVID. We saw the world around us having lots of troubles. In our hometown, 70 of the nursing home residents died. Over 300 had gotten COVID while we were in the bubble. There was a moment or two where we were just having a good time. But the stress built up, and this is another part of this that is really, really hard to talk about, and it, 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 it's not easy to live with your coworkers for two months straight and to be away from your families, especially during the time of a pandemic, this massive crisis. But it got us through. But it wasn't enough. We made it to the end of May. We knew that we couldn't keep it going forward. What then should we do? And it felt like the flood waters had risen all around us and we were just safe on our roof. But again, it's not enough. That's not, a, that's not saving the day. What do we need to do next? So I had this <laughs> feeling like uh, there's a scene in Jaws where the guy talks about going into a shark cage. And then the, the old experienced guy, Quint says, you go in the cage, cage goes in the water, sharks in the water. That's our shark. And I kept thinking, oh my God, we're, we're leaving the bubble to get into the water with this thing. How are we gonna stay safe? Well, the first was testing, of course. We worked really hard to find partners uh, and testing, 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 testing. Uh, the, there was this uh, comedy show late night that they talked about the importance of testing and it stuck with me and it really, testing, testing, testing. So I ended up learning a lot about testing. We had PCR testing. Eventually we ended up with rapid antigen testing. The upside of it was that we had partners uh, from the get-go with Bristol Hospital, but then that disappeared when they had increasing responsibilities to other partners that they had. So we had to find another partner. We found a partner at Yale Pathology Labs. They stuck with us and they kept up with us. And I think they were able to keep their workload enough so that it never got really crazy for the number of days before we got a turnaround. But the problem, of course, with PCR testing is it tells you the truth about what it was like four days ago or five days ago, which isn't really telling you the truth about what it is that day. And rapid testing just didn't exist for us at that time. So testing was a partial solution, but not a final solution. It was also really expensive. We began testing all of our staff and all of our residents every week. And that started in June. The upside of that is that it saved us from at least one asymptomatic case in June. And most of the cases that we've detected among our staff have been asymptomatic. So again, the checkpoints just don't work. They just don't work. So the testing helped us a lot. It's expensive. It takes a lot of time. The staff have to tolerate it coming in every week. And of course, you want to do serial testing if you do have a, 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 a positive case. But we found, again, testing is not enough because, again, it tells you the truth about what happened four days ago or what go, is going on four days ago, but it doesn't really help you in the short term. And then the rapid testing has all kinds of troubles and challenges with accuracy. And so, again, testing is just not enough. It's a part of the program. It's part of the line of defenses. It's really essential, but it's just not enough. So we're back in the water with the shark again. Another part, another tip, another part of our solution was the use of KN95s. Back when I was a Marine, we really got to know our weapon systems, really got to know our tools, the things that we use. Masks, of course, respirators, of course, have been sort of the tool that everyone needs to really get smart on. Uh, you know, what you're seeing here in this picture is the 1860. They cost $40 a piece off eBay in the springtime. It really wasn't a practical option for us when we came out of the bubble. 
So the best next best thing was the KN95. The KN95s actually have some advantages versus N95s in that they're more comfortable, they're far more affordable. Again, KN95 means that it meets the Chinese specifications for an N95 mask. If you look closely at the 3M website, you'll see that they say that they're pretty good, except that they've got some vapors coming off the side. They're not quite as airtight as the OSHA certified N95s for the United States. But we began using them right as soon as we left the bubble. Thank God. Again, we could no longer presume that our staff was safe. We, instead, we had to flip that assumption to, we had active positive cases here, walking amongst us. We could test for it. We'll find out in four days whether they're positive, but we had to assume that there were positive people walking and helping and caring for our elderly people here. The KN95s helped us have a little bit more confidence as we did that. And again, they cost about $4 a piece back in June. Now they cost about a buck 50 or even down to 60 cents, depending on the style that you get. The best style that we recommend are the head strap ones because they provide a very nice seal around uh, to prevent the vapors from coming out. Again, KN95s are not enough. When they say 95, they mean 5% is still getting through the particles. And so if you have someone in a room with a resident for a long enough period of time, the vapors are building up around the face. The vapors are building up in the room. It's viral load. That's the expression that they, in some countries, some places, they design their hospitals with open windows so you can get fresh air. And during the summertime, I think in the South, part of what happened was people were going in for the air conditioning and closing all the windows. So this viral load was happening in the South of the United States and this is how it was being spread. It's the vapor, the aerosol. Some of the transmissions that have happened in care homes have been rapid in a speed that have been like 10 people, 20 people, 30 people at a time, all at the same time. I believe that a lot of that has to do with, or those mass spreading events have to do with aerosol transmission. And they talk about super spreading events maybe responsible for as much as 80% of the transmissions of COVID. If that's true, I don't really believe that people are going up and spitting in people's faces one by one by one. I think it has a lot more to do with the aerosol transmissions. Even the KN95s are not enough. The air needs to be clean. So we're back in the water. And this is where I had an innovation that I really, really wanna share. I don't hear very many people talking about it. Uh, air purifiers. Uh, in, we, so in October, we began buying them. We bought 75 for our home. Each of our resident rooms have two uh, air purifiers. This is the Allen Flex. It looks nice. It, it's not that expensive. It is expensive, but it's not that expensive. About $350 a piece. We put two of them in every one of our resident rooms. So just because it's a shared room doesn't inevitably mean that one resident would give it to the other if someone developed COVID. Also, if the caregiver is in the room providing care and with their mask, maybe there's a gap here or there, and the viral load begins building up in the air, it'll get caught by one of these HEPA filters. Now HEPA is basically as strong as an N100 mask. The concept is you wanna take all the air in the room and run it through this N100 mask over and over and over again. A lot of the air purifiers can process as much as 200 cubic feet per minute. 200 cubic feet per minute, what does that mean? So I had to like look into what is it? It turns out that a human being exhales, at least from what I found on my effort at research, exhales about a quarter of a cubic foot per minute. So each one of these air purifiers is actually cleaning, cleansing 800 times what one person exhales at a given time. Ah, okay. Now, what if you put more than one together? It turns out that the standard in a surgical room at a hospital is 20 to 30 air changes per hour. Then it becomes a math question. And most of the homes of our, uh, most of the rooms in our home, it's just a matter of putting four or five of these together. And then you have the air sanitation of a hospital surgical room. So COVID spreads from large droplets, aerosol, and by touch. The touch, you just gotta keep your hands clean and watch what you touch. The droplets, they're caught by the KN95s. The aerosol, especially heading into the winter time and we have to close all the windows to keep the heat in. The aerosol is caught by the air purifiers. 
that are grinding out 20 to 30 air changes per hour in our crucial rooms, including dining rooms, common rooms, visitation rooms. Our families have been able to visit us 20 to 30 times a week. We've got 20 to 30 family visits a week. We give them a K95 mask, they sit in our special visitor room and they've, we've got the four or five air purifiers working on it. How does this compare financially versus HVAC? So we installed an exhaust fan. The exhaust fan exhausts only 200 cubic feet per minute. And I paid $2,000 for it. Instead, you could buy one of these for 350 and get the same effect for the room. And by the way, when they're talking about surgical rooms, they count HEPA filters as being equivalent to air being exhausted. So it really is the good stuff. So when we combine all these together, we bought 75 air purifiers. Uh, it cost me over $40,000. Again, massive loans for my savings to pay for all this, but it was the right thing to do, and I don't regret it. And it also saved our home. It saved our residents. One of the nicest things that it was able to do for us was that if there was a humanitarian visit, a family was coming in to sit alongside a bed, the bed of someone who was passing, we could give them an N95. We could set these air purifiers up in the room so it would protect the roommate and protect the home, and they could sit bedside with the person who is passing. I don't know how to put like a value on that, but as compared to dying from COVID often alone in a hospital or in a nursing home without visitation, it's one of these priceless things that I'll always remember from this year, like that we were able to provide that for our residents. All right, air purifiers. Another thing that we were able to do because they're portable, when on one of our staff members was suspecting that maybe one of her daughters had COVID because the daughter had been hanging out with someone who was test positive. We lent out three or four air purifiers to her so she could take it into her apartment where they cohabitated, they lived with their daughter who had been maybe exposed. So that if the daughter was to develop COVID, it wouldn't necessarily transfer to the mother and it wouldn't necessarily transfer back to our home and our residence or their, our staff member's husband who had a lot of health conditions. We were able to lend out portable air purifiers to our staff. Another idea for the air, portable air purifiers, one of our residents passed away. And again, we were able to do the humanitarian visits, all this. The family chose in late November to have a wake at a funeral home. I was afraid for them. And we even brought one of our residents out to that wake, at least before everyone else came into it. I was really afraid for them. What I did was I went out, I set up the air purifiers in the funeral home before the showing. And they kept going throughout the entire wake. People wore their masks and the air purifiers helped prevent viral load from building up in the room. Whenever a strike team comes out from the state of Connecticut to a home that's in jeopardy of COVID, they ought to have a truck full of these things to just unload and make sure that there's no more aerosol transmission. Whenever a hospital thinks maybe that there's a room or two, because uh, most hospital rooms that changes per air uh, per hour is about six. One of these things or a couple of these things could really make a difference. Now, why am I going on and on? I really think that this has made a difference for our home. One of our staff members tested positive. She had been wearing the KN95. She had worked five nights in a row before testing positive. I'm grateful that she wore her mask, but I just know that there was still vapor coming off her face. I'm glad that these caught it. This is me, a picture that I took just today. You can see the air purifiers. This is our visitation room. And you can see me wearing a proper KN95 with the head strap. We feel like this got us to a pretty safe place. Our bubble bridged us to a time of better testing and equipment. The testing was, is much, much better now. The equipment we're spot on for, and we've got the air purifiers. We sent out a survey of our families and an anonymous reply. 59 we sent out, or it was about 59, and we got about 31 in return. All of them were universally positive five out of five stars. People really, really appreciated what we did for their loved ones and for our home. And we reached this milestone. Two, day, two weeks ago, we got our first shots of the vaccine. All of our residents participated, about 80% of our staff participated. 
Uh, the biggest concern among our staff is about reproductive health. They just don't feel like there's been enough information or enough that's been told to them about it. Most of our staff members are young ladies who are interested to have children sometime very soon. And it's something we have to respect and we've got to talk about. What is the effect of reproductive health? And there's a lot of trash, there's a lot of garbage out on the internet. But now as the weeks have gone by and are going by and we have our next shot next week, the immunity is going to build in our home. Our health crisis is effectively over. Our financial crisis, our financial jeopardy is still ongoing. So I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars loaned out to our business to try to keep it up. I'm beginning to get up against the wall now and I just don't know how things are going to go going forward. Now there's this thing called the CARES Act where you're supposed to get provider relief. We've gotten some assistance through phase two Phase three, two weeks ago, we got a denial letter with no explanation and no means of appeal. The phase three would have covered 88% of our losses during the first half of 2020. No explanation, no appeal. And I've heard that we're not alone. So I reached out to our legislators and we're trying to work on, find out what the heck happened. At the very least, we want to know why we were denied. So if someone out there can help us with that, we need to relieve the financial jeopardy that the home is in so that we can be strong in case something else comes along. But right now, we're not getting any help. These are my grandmothers. This is me fresh out of Officer Candidate School. This is just before 9-11. My, both my grandmothers have passed. I hope they're looking down and that they're proud of me. I hope that we've tried hard, that we've done the right thing for our residents. Again, they were residents of Shady Oaks. I, you know, I, I tried to do right for the residents here as I would have done for my own grandparents. Again, these are my parents. My father passed three years ago. My mom's still around. I talk to her every night. She's very proud of us. She donated to help us get through the, the bubble. But we, as a country ought to have stood up for our seniors. And what a world it would have been different if America had stood for its seniors and really, really helped out the senior care homes. Over 40% of the deaths in the United States have been residents of senior care homes, assisted livings and nursing homes. In Connecticut, it's about 70% of our deaths have been in care homes. We can do better and from the lessons that we've learned in these care homes, we ought to be sharing it with everybody else because we've been face to face with the shark on multiple occasions now. Uh, we've had six staff members test positive, two while we were in the bubble and we kept ourselves protected because they were on the outside of the bubble. One in June when we were wearing our KN95s and had our testing and caught this asymptomatic case. And then in November and December, we had three more cases but none of it got to our residents and none of it got to our coworkers. It's something that I wanted to share today. I'm grateful for this opportunity. So again, this is Shady Oaks. Our biggest tips are about the bubble testing, KN95s and purifiers. We're very proud and happy to have reached this milestone and be able to share some good news uh, from, our, you know, from our experience here. Again, my name is Tyson. You're welcome to reach out to us. Our email is at the bottom, info at shadyoaksassistedliving.com. And that's what I've got. Thank you so much. Tyson, thank you. That was a, a really, really great uh, presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions, but I'll just say a few quick things. I'm actually just going to read some, some comments. Uh, um, one comment uh, that we got during your talk was Tyson is phenomenal. I feel like he should be a national hero. Uh, he should headline every conference. Tyson should lead all the COVID responses everywhere, seriously. <laughs> um, when you were talking about some, some aerosol uh, science, we, we have some of the world's leading aerosol scientists actually watching uh, right now. And, uh, and in the chat, they were both saying that they agree completely with, with what you've been saying, which is uh, you know, a very high compliment uh, to get. So uh, thanks for, for everything you've done and thanks for the, uh, the really great talk. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Tyson. It's Katie from ECV and also from Connecticut. I'm so glad you came. Hey, Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure you made a bunch of people cry too. So <laughs> it was very touching. Was Thank you. Great talk. Okay, uh, the next talk we have is um, from Tiffany James. Uh, Tiffany's a uh, community engagement public relations specialist and uh, political consultant from Columbia, South Carolina. Recently, she was the South Carolina Deputy Political Director and um, Black Engagement Director for presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. Uh, today, she'll tell us a little bit about how grassroots organizations can leverage relationships and build support to create an effective movement. So uh, welcome, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tiffany James, and um, Derek has told you a little bit about me, but um, I do a lot of community engagement, um, whether it has to do with um, campaigns or um, issues such as COVID-19. And I am going to share my screen with you all. Give me one moment. Sorry, okay. I'm so sorry, I'm trying to get back to where I can share the screen. That's okay, take your time. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, and All right, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, well, um, I have been working in Columbia, South Carolina um, with in coronavirus, and we have been doing a lot of community engagement and getting um, a coalition on board to in coronavirus. Um, so we call ourselves in coronavirus SC, and we are basically telling people how they can be a hero, how they could be a hero in their own communities. And today I am going to talk to you about how you can be a hero in um, connecting to your community and building your relationships. It starts with you. <laughs> it starts with you. Um, just remember that you are your, um, your, your best resource and you have more within you than you would ever know. A lot of people say that, oh, um, I have never been a community organizer before. Um, I wouldn't know where to start. No, you know where to start. You start with yourself in your own relationships. Um, before I get into that, I want to talk to you about a little bit of, about what we've done in um, South Carolina, um, some community um, action that we've done. Uh, we have created a um, community action, oops, sorry. Okay, so we created um, a, a um, community engagement team where we trained people. Um, we did um, HIPAA training in which um, our community engagement team are able to reach out to um, their um, their relationships, whether it's church members, their families and friends, and um, ask them about their symptoms um, dealing with COVID-19, um, and also ask them about um, any um, items that they may need um, to fulfill their basic needs. So um, since they are collecting medical information as to whether or not somebody is positive or negative, um, we were able to get them HIPAA trained um, so we can keep um, everyone's information co confidential. We got a church to um, uh, perform a community engagement team within their church so they can keep their church members safe. So that's one of the things we've done. Um, we've also, provided a um, CT scan COVID testing site. So um, we've um, we partnered with a, um, a local 
doctor office. Um, it's Eau Claire Clinics. And um, basically their doctors um, are able to take people, um, new clients, um, and they are able to um, request to get a CT scan um, if they um, would like to get their symptoms um, checked um, for COVID. Um, the next thing we've done is uh, we've had a max mass donations to the Green Link bus system in South Carolina. At the very beginning of the pandemic, our, the bus drivers did not have any PPE. And I know everyone remembers, it was like everyone trying to get their hands on PPE at the beginning. Um, so we were able to donate a thousand masks to um, the bus system in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, we've also um, were able to um, connect with Fairfield County, which is a county in South Carolina. Um, their administration donated an isolation home to us, um, to our efforts in order to um, have a space where people can isolate outside of their homes um, if they were not able to isolate at their homes. So um, they have a five bedroom home that they um, donated to our efforts. So if um, anyone uh, wants to voluntarily isolate away from their families, they will be able to do so. As we know, um, there are a lot of marginalized communities or um, there are just a lot of rural communities where people um, live uh, together in compact areas um, and also in multi-generational homes. So that's very important that we um, that we receive this donation. And we're also seeking more um, donations for isolation spaces as well. Also, we were able to provide calls consultation and support from the National Scientist Volunteer Database to um, a business um, coalition called Safe Dining SC. And basically Safe Dining SC is a coalition of restaurants throughout the state who basically got together because they didn't have direction from our leaders in the state. They didn't know what to do. So they got together to try to figure things out themselves. Um, they were able to get in touch with me and I connected them to um, the uh, Sciences Volunteer da Database um, in order to provide them with information that they would not have gotten otherwise. Um, so we were able to also connect with the South Carolina Democratic Party before um, elections, before they did their get out the vote, we were able to connect with them and talk to them about um, preventative measures um, while they um, performed their get out the vote efforts. Um, another thing that we've done is um, a lot of artists lost their jobs during um, COVID. So we had a, a, a fundraiser that we sponsored for artists to um, basically get some money to perform online and um, to, to get a little money in their pockets um, during this time. And uh, so we were able to do that and um, support our artists in order for us to get support from them. Um, which is key to partnership. Um, here's a picture of the of me <laughs> and um, people um, at Greenlink, the Greenlink bus system, um, and also an environmental group, Upstate Forever. Uh, we all got together and um, we had the mask in our hands and on our faces um, that we were donating to Greenlink. And this is another um, community action that we did. Uh, we had a food drive. We got in touch with local farmers um, to provide food for um, an area that's in a food desert and um, an area that has high unemployment numbers. And um, so many people had lost their jobs during the pandemic um, that food was uh, basically Food was a, a need before the pandemic, and it's definitely uh, um, a need now um, during the pandemic. So we had, I wish I had a picture of the cars, but we had cars wrapped around like the entire neighborhood and they came to, to get some fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's another um, uh, community action that we were able to do. Um, so how do we connect? How do we get all of this done? Well, so we connect we connected with different organizations, like with the food drive, we connected with Eat Smart Move More South Carolina. They provided us with a grant to provide the food to, um, to the neighborhood. Um, so we connected with them um, through our values and our interests. So basically 
I know that my values is fairness, my values is truth and justice. And so um, I think I I believe that um, COVID-19 has hit, um, you know, black and brown communities um, the hardest. It has hit the black and brown communities the hardest. Um, so there is an um, equity issue there. And since my value is fairness, um, I um, went to organizations that um, provide, um, you know, food for um, people who live in food deserts. I was able to talk to them about what we're doing with um, in coronavirus and um, how we wanted to give back to the community. We connected on that value because they saw that the food um, insecurity issue was exasperated um, during the um, COVID-19 crisis. So we were able to connect on um, that value. Um, another thing is interest. So we were able to connect with um, healthcare workers um because we had the same interests so um of course healthcare workers at especially at the very beginning was looking for ways to um help the community and we were able to connect with um a clinic who was open to um provide prescriptions for ct scanning to provide another testing option in an area that did not have a lot of testing, PCR testing available. So um, we had the same interest and was able to, co to connect and partner um, with that interest. Um, so how can you like organize your own relationships? So step one, look right where you're at like it starts with you and then you can look at to your family your friends your coworkers, your church members or organizations that you're a part of um start with them and you say hey this is what i'm doing would you like to be involved you connect with them with their values what they care about and what their interests are so for instance when i connected with the church um i was able to say hey you know a lot of um black and black, brown people, especially in rural areas, because this church happened to be in a rural area, um, are not um, able to get information, um, you know, like a lot of other um, communities. Um, so how can we connect um, so you can um, connect with your members and provide them information and check on them on a daily basis? and you already do that with your um, services that you already provide, you can kind of just um, implement this alongside the things that you're already doing. So I was able to connect with the church on um, you know, the same values, the same interests and get them involved in what we were doing. Um, and then also your friends and family, um, people just, People don't know that they can actually um, connect with their friends and family. Where do they work at? Do they work at a nonprofit that can um, that can partner with what you're trying to do? Do they um, have a church that you can connect with that um, can help with some of the um, community action? Um, so just look to your friends and family to see like what their circles are and what they're involved in in order to partner and connect to do this work. Um, and also, of course, co-workers as well, um, get, getting businesses involved. Um, one way I was able to get Safe Dining SC involved is through my connection with a friend who was a restaurant owner. And he was struggling with keeping his restaurant open. And um, yeah, he was just struggling with keeping his restaurant open. And he told me he was a part of Safe Dining SC. And he said that he would love to get the information that we had to offer. So we were able to have consultation sessions with um, a, a lot of restaurant owners because of my connection that I had with this restaurant owner. So um, it starts with you and just look at your different connections that you have. Maybe there's a restaurant owner that you're close to that you can get businesses involved. Maybe there is um, an organization that you volunteer at that you can connect um, you can connect with, um, you know, with your values and your, your the same interests, and get them involved with um, the COVID efforts that um, that you would like to see in your community. Um, also, elected officials and leaders, um, you can always do cold calling. Um, if you don't know any elected officials, if you don't know any 
any community leaders, you can reach out to um, organizations. Um, you just do a Google search for, you know, or like grassroots organizations and say, hey, I see that your, um, your mission is to help people um, who have pre-existing conditions. Uh, it just so happens that COVID is really affecting people with pre-existing conditions and we want to help reach those people. Can we partner so we can get the information out to the people that you serve, to your clients? Um, so, you know, when you do cold calling, you connect with the organization and you connect with the elected officials on an issue that you share interest in. So with an elected official, if you have um, an elected official who is, um, you know, who has a bill on housing, then you can say, hey, um, the eviction rates are up high because of COVID. How can we connect and work together um, to um, ensure that people still have homes and also to ensure that people have isolation spaces outside their homes, right? So I think that there's a lot of connection you can do with cold calling, with just saying, hey, you know, I don't know you, but I know your issue and this is how it connects and this is how we can work together. Another, um, another way you can build partnership is with community organizers. And that's um, people that you see that are, you know, leading the marches, that are um, doing the civil disobedience, um, reach out to reporters. Um, and saying, hey, I see that you did a story on this community leader. Can you connect me with them? Because this is what we're doing. Connect with community leaders who are already in the trenches, who are already doing the work. And then that way, they will be able to incorporate what you're trying to do in your community um, as it pertains to COVID-19. And um, you can work together on that. COVID intersects so many different um, so many different fields. It intersects health, of course, um, transportation, um, schools. So there's teachers who have um, interest in the students. A lot of people leave the youth out. Like, what can you do to connect with youth groups to get youth to actually um, be involved in community organizing? So um, there are so many different ways that you can connect to different people in the community because COVID is affecting everyone. Um, so stakeholder engagement. So um, you have to think about the buy-in, right? Like, but first you have to be bought in to, uh, to what you're pushing out. So I'm bought into the fact that we can get rid of um, COVID-19 through the zero COVID strategy by, um, you know, a supported, um, shutdown or stay at home order. I believe that stopping transmission is the best way to get rid of the virus. I have to believe that in order to sell it. So you have to have your, the buy-in with yourself first. Um, you have to truly believe that this is, you know, the way to go. And then that way you'll be able to inspire others to get on board with you. So with them, like, how do you get the buy-in with them? Like we were saying before, you connect with them with their interests and values and, um, you know, what matters to them and connect with them with the work that they're already doing as well. Seeing how you can um, um, insert um, COVID action um, in your community with work that's already being done on the ground with the people you're trying to get on board, the stakeholders you're trying to get on board, and then ownership. So one of the reasons why it's important to um, work with people who are already doing the work or already um, have a COVID initiative is because um, it will be easy for them to take ownership of it. Um, if people are doing the work and they don't feel like they own it, if they feel like they're doing it for someone else, but they're not doing it to um, have that sense of ownership or to help the clients that they're already helping, they have to own it in some way in order for them to stay engaged and to, uh, to keep the retention of the group that you're building. All right, you are the hero in your community. You are the hero, you plus me equals we. We're all in this together. And um, that is the key message with 
all of the people that you partner with to build your relationships. We're all in this together. This is how COVID is affecting all of this. And we're in this together. It's all hands on deck in order for us to stop this virus. And that is it. You can contact me. Um, this is my phone number and my email address. And if you all have any questions, I am happy to, to answer them for you to the best of my ability. Great, thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, there was a, a sort of point uh, brought up by Greta in the chat uh, that your talk was sort of like a little blueprint for uh, community health success. So I, I think that's a pretty good, pretty good compliment. I've, I've really been impressed. I've been sort of watching you do this community work for, for months now. It's it's really been impressive. If we, uh, if like every community had like 10 Tiffany's, I think this would be like, uh, COVID would be solved nearly immediately. So uh, it's been, it's been really nice to watch you. Thank you. I couldn't do it without your support for sure. I'm sure you could, but uh, that's very nice of you to say. <laughs> no, I couldn't. <laughs> Okay, well, um, if anybody has any questions for Tiffany, uh, feel free to contact her either on Slack or in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, thank you again, Tiffany. Thank you. Okay, let's see, who do we have next? Uh, I have uh, Michelle and Eric next. Um, so, um, Michelle and Eric are the founders of Make Good Together, which is a grassroots organization which aims to slow the spread of COVID. Um, its goal is to sort of empower individuals to take action and become a leader in their social circle by modeling safe behavior and having difficult conversations with their friends and families. Um, today, they'll tell us a bit about their organization and, and teach us about how a bottom-up leadership model could be integral in successfully ending the pandemic. So uh, Michelle and Eric, it's uh, very nice to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So first off, like ncoronavirus.org and Nexi are two outstanding organizations. Like kudos to you guys in bringing like all these awesome speakers together to, to share ideas and to like actually put something into action. Like now I feel like I have some like actionable things to take away. And then also to dovetail our conversation um, after Tiffany's is like outstanding. Like it starts with you. I heard that like twice in that presentation and I'm like, yeah, that's where it's at. So this meeting feels uh, very cohesive. Very uh, cohesive. Yeah. So the pandemic is a people problem and it requires a people solution. Each of us can take accountability right now. Our words and actions not only matter, they influence. Our influence, our individual influence is a powerful tool for ending the pandemic. Boldly declaring our leadership is incredibly empowering. I, Michelle Lukasik, promise to be a leader within my social circle to annihilate COVID-19. If you feel inspired doing, during our chat, fill out your name and hit send in the chat. Um, you being here is proof that you're undeniably a leader already. Barack Obama said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. You don't need a title to be a leader. Influence is leadership. Leadership comes in many forms and it's required to end the pandemic. No matter what your passion or talent is, you have a bigger role to play. <clears throat> Bottom-up leadership matters. We need people to be empowered to do the right thing, to do the right things and, be pos and po to positively influence others. It comes from many directions, leadership does. We have seen how top-down leadership plays a huge role in addressing and managing a pandemic. There's no question there, but what about bottom-up leadership? Bottom-up on-the-ground leadership taken on by everyday people is integral to the success of ending a pandemic. 
So Make Good Together, uh, its mission really is to empower everyday people to be leaders within their social circles to annihilate COVID-19. And when I said that it dovetails so well with what Tiffany was speaking of is like the individual and then like your social circle and then groups, like it just levels up in such a beautiful way. And it really starts with like individual empowerment and action. So why within social circles? Why, why do we have the distinction of saying within social circles? Why isn't empowering everyday people to be leaders period enough? Like what's the deal with this social circle stuff? Well, we distinctly include empowering everyday people to be leaders within their social circles for two reasons. The first reason is a bit complex and it takes from um, disciplines such as sociology and social group behavior and psychology and human behavior. And the second reason really speaks more to the logistics or the mechanics of how influence and change spread in a society. So why leadership within social circles matter? Reason one, we bend the rules for friends and family. We bend the rules for friends and family and this is sort of a huge problem. So Eric and I are two everyday people who saw a lack of personal accountability and leadership at the social circle level. A lack of leadership from our friends, family members, neighborhoods, or neighbors rather, was something that we, the people, could take on. We didn't have to wait for anyone to tell us to take action, to take action. So we decided to dedicate our time and efforts to help empower everyday people to be the leaders that the world needs. And the result was make good together. We don't have backgrounds in advocacy or activism. In fact, we don't have an ounce of experience in them. Um, if you asked us a year ago, if building and growing a movement around empowering people to make positive change in the world would be something we'd be a part of, we'd probably say no. So my background is in brand strategy and marketing communications, which as it turns out actually does quite come in handy um, when creating and managing a movement that is completely digital. And my background is in mostly massage therapy and the restaurant industry. Aside from my sales experience, um, it's completely new and uncharted territory for me in many ways. Mm -hmm. So while our backgrounds don't exactly fit into what you think starting a movement might look like, and we really had no idea what we were getting into when we started this, the truth is you don't have to have a background in advocacy or activism to build a movement. You just have to have an idea and a passion to see it through to completion. And to get it to, to stick, if you will, it needs to have relevancy in a space that no one else is really seeing and or addressing. We are future thinkers. We are psychology and sociology hobbyists or more like personality type and social behavior nerds. Early on during the pandemic, we would spend hours discussing and analyzing the numbers, charts, graphs. <clears throat> we try to make connections between the data and human behavior through the lens of what we were seeing in Chicago, where we live and within our immediate social circles. We were doing everything to the T. We stayed home and didn't go out unless it was essential. We wore our masks every time we stepped outside. We even <laughs> placed hand sanitizer strategically around our house so we'd have, every, so we'd have access to it on every floor. We live in a four-story townhome. So we were doing all that we could. We were doing all that we could. Right? Well, yes, and also no. We were doing the right things, but where we realized we were really struggling is not in following the rules and guidelines. We were struggling in very personal scenarios where we had to tell friends and family, no, no, I can't see you in person. No, I can't come home for the holidays. <clears throat> no, I don't feel safe not wearing a mask. We are social beings and probably so but we are so influenced by our peers that it creates a problem in the face of a pandemic with following all of the guidelines. We've been asked by authorities to keep physical distance as a way to stop transmission. <clears throat> with good reason, we should keep our physical distance, 
But historically, keeping our physical distance was a bad thing. Denying physical proximity or touch meant that you were intentionally denying human connection. Years and years of evolutionary history psychologically informs us that the physical proximity and touch are gestures of care, inclusion, and being accepted into a tribe. Social harmony and the need to please others or be non-confrontational is a strong innate drive or influencing factor. So the truth is we kind of have to flip our deep-rooted tendencies during the pandemic like completely upside down because today denying physical proximity and touch is not a gesture of care or exclusion. It's a gesture of care and love. Um, we've been asked over the course of weeks or months to go against the evolutionary imperative to be close physically. And this is so difficult. It feels unnatural. When we go outside and wear a mask, it's our choice, our decision, our inconvenience, our own personal sacrifice. But when we have to tell a friend that we can't grab brunch, well, that just feels like we're denying or refusing friendship. When we have to tell a relative that we can't visit home for a family tradition, well, that just feels like we're being disrespectful or unloving. The moments where we have to deny physical proximity to the ones we love and the ones we care about hurts. Like social disharmony hurts. Like it literally hurts. Our pain receptors actually light up. Saying no to friends and family can feel pretty awful. It feels risky. It feels like friction. It feels um, socially disharmonious. Our minds get flooded with what ifs. What if my dad gets mad at me for not coming home? What if my friend thinks I don't want to hang out anymore because I'm not comfortable eating in restaurants? What if my sister takes me not wanting to give her a hug as a gesture that I don't care as much? What if saying no is going to cause friction? Saying no can feel like we are okay with jeopardizing a connection. In social situations, we feel a need to make things comfortable for others. We are wired to maintain social harmony. And when we're pressured with the choice of pleasing someone or following expert scientific advice, there is a confliction of our values, which creates cognitive dissonance. The stress, this stress may cause us to cave into accepting invitations, bending the rules and being more risk prone. These actions become part of our behavior and then part of our shared group's behavior. <clears throat> We've identified a key moment that everyone has experienced <laughs> and no one was really talking about. We coined it the, the cringe, cringe moment. moment. The cringe moment. <laughs> cringe moment. <clears throat> and it's expressive of that awkward feeling we get when we have to say no to friends and family to keep ourselves and everyone else safe. So our bodies physiologically react, like we tense up, we get nervous about how to answer, um, and we are torn between doing what's best for public safety and what we perceive is best to keep those closest to us happy. We evolutionarily have been trained to not ruffle feathers. We don't want to disappoint people. We don't want our friends and family to think we are rejecting or denying them. So we consider the possibility of maybe just this once taking the unsafe option just to keep social harmony. So an example that I have of like the first time I like actually recognized this cringe moment was when my friend Curtis asked me to go get brunch with him. Well, he more specifically said, let's get brunch, take out and then go to a park and, you know, have a have a, a brunch like in a park outdoors. And at that point, like I had only been going outside for to get my prescription refilled. That was really the only thing. So for me and like the steps I was taking to be safe for myself and for others, that was outside of my boundaries. And I had this moment, like literally, like I just, everything compressed in my body and I felt like, what do I do here? Like I either say yes to my friend and violate my own like personal, personal ethos around what safety means in, during a pandemic or 
like, I just didn't know what to do. And that was like the first time I really kind of had to wrap my head around like, oh shoot, this is a situation that I have felt like before in a couple situations, I'm probably gonna have to deal with moving forward. So that was kind of like a real kind of like aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really um, it can happen with any type of invite, you know, um, any type of in-person invite, you know, whatever your standards are, you know, for um, doing your part in the pandemic. Um, my example is uh, a more recent event when we had to have uh, workers in our home um, for utility work. Um, there was a leak under our sink and it was really um, uh, several cringe moments <laughs> that we had to go through, um, you know, whether it was, um, their masks slipping down and um, the, the mask not being uh, like uh, the mask being too thin to be a proper, you know, mask and, and just like uh, the feeling. And, um, you know, there were even, there was a moment where uh, uh, one of the people pulled their mask down to say something louder that to us. That was awkward. And then um, going for the handshake at the <laughs> end. So, um, all those, all those moments are really, you know, going against <laughs> what we're trying to do and what we've been trained as a species yeah. to do. It's funny because like we have a staircase like right over there and I was like up on the staircase and like the person like went to reach for Eric's hand and I was so proud because like Eric's like, yeah, no, I, I'm not doing handshakes right now. And like, those are the hard situations where it's in the moment, it's hard to make the right call, but just like recognizing that that dissonance you have about doing what's right and doing what socially feels right, that can give you a bit of a pause to, to recognize it and to choose to yeah. do the right thing. Being, a, being able to identify and be like, wait, this is a decision moment where I can continue with this plan that I had, you know, um, to, to go about uh, fighting the pandemic or like, is this when my behavior is going to shift? So, so if you, if you like listeners have any experience, like if you are, this experience is resonating with you where you had these cringe moments, like where you were torn between what's right. And then like social harmony, like, you know, say yes, or share like a share briefly in the chat. We'd be like, so interested in hearing your, your personal situations around this cringe moment we're talking about. So our discomfort for saying no to friends and family when they ask us to take part in unsafe scenarios or behaviors is really the driving factor behind why we started Make Good Together. We knew others had to have been having similar difficulties and we knew that people were breaking the rules to not disappoint friends and family. The scenarios that test our ability to make the right call are infinite. When a friend asks to go to a bar, when a coworker wants to have an in-person meeting without masks, when a mom you haven't seen from a different state insists that you visit. <clears throat> These are all awkward situations and we often cave in to keep the social harmony. The way we can create the biggest impact is by feeling empowered to do the right thing, even when it's uncomfortable or awkward. People's decisions are greatly influenced by their friends, family, and social groups and therefore everyone has the power to make a difference. We need to normalize <clears throat> action that puts long-term global health on the same plane as short-term individual comfort. We need to boldly redefine how we convey and accept love and care to gently wrap the truth in explicit compassion and mutual understanding. The entire world is adapting and shifting. With both grace and conviction, we can reframe how we say no. So that's the first reason why leadership within social circles matters. Social pressure and how we address this issue of people not following the safety guidelines in social settings. So the second reason why leadership within social, circle mat social circles matters really revolves around the logistics or the mechanics of influence and how it spreads from person to person. So it's kind of weird to say, but the analogy of how the virus spreads 
from person to person is not all that dissimilar to how leadership spreads through influence. Bad decisions affect more than our health and people around us health. Um, it really shows other people within your social circle that you are okay reinforcing these really negative, unsafe actions. We are re reinforcing behaviors that perpetuate the virus. Leadership also spreads person to person. And sometimes to go big and change the world, we need to go small and change ourselves and then powerfully influence those around us. So I'm gonna share with you some slides about what bottom up leadership really looks like. So at the start here, you can see at an individual level, um, individuals that feel empowered to make change tend to take more action than those who feel hopeless. So on a personal level, I might have like the credo where I'm always, I always wear a mask or I say no to indoor parties or when the vaccine becomes available to me, I'll take it. From there, the individual level kind of levels up to social circles. And this is where you have a lot of influence and social circles determine which actions a group deems acceptable. So collectively, the group might decide we always wear a mask when we gather distance outdoors or this year we're not going to do in person holidays or hey, I know like it's really weird when we're together when we want to like hug each other, but let's you know, let's just say we're not going to hug each other. It doesn't mean we don't love each other, but we're just going to like draw the line there. Um, from there, social circles kind of level up to groups and groups are really like kind of clusters of social circles and groups make rules and guidelines for members to follow. So these could be schools, interest groups, like associations or boards, churches, businesses, events. So for instance, like a music venue might say events are canceled until further notice or a dance studio might like draw the line in the sand to say we're suspending our in-person dance classes. So from there, groups really comprise like are what com communities are comprised of. And at the community level, that's where we can see where individual, individual influence to social circle that then translates to groups up to communities um, where you can start to see uh, change in social norms, like an individual has the power to shift a social norm in a very powerful way. So for instance, like let's pretend the Chicago Restaurant Association has this rule that all its members um, are only offering outdoor seating or like um, businesses in the Lincoln Square District um, to mandate mask wearing as an example. So from there, really it levels up to city, state, and country. Um, our influence can spread so wide and social norms inform our behaviors. Behaviors such as wearing masks can be normalized. Behavioral shifts across the globe can change the world, like really can change the world. So, can you see how personal leadership within social circles is important? <clears throat> so now that we can see the need for individuals to be leaders within their social circles, what exactly does Make Good Together do? The movement's main component is a promise certificate. We ask everyday people to make a promise. The promise certificate reinforces our commitment and accountability to make smart choices, always, even in uncomfortable social situations. The promise certificate shows our friends and family that we are taking a leadership role. I, Eric C. Nixon, promise to be a leader within my social circle to annihilate COVID-19. This simple act of signing and sharing the promise certificate empowers people and the collective of hundreds of other people who have also signed the promise certificate creates a strong shared social identity. We are creating a beautiful group of empathetic and motivated leaders who are ready to do difficult things for the betterment of the entire human family. They are acting as beacons and positively influencing those closest to them. Positive influence has a ripple effect. All right, Katie Marsh, get ready. <laughs> um, sometimes 
people like print out our physical promise certificate that you can get at makegoodtogether.com like Katie did. Um, Katie's with N Coronavirus and Nexi. Amazing human, by the way. Um, but yeah, so people will take a photo, sign it, take a photo, post it on their social media platforms, tag us at Make Good Together and tag other people that they want to get inspired in this movement. Um, if people don't have printers, I'm a graphic designer. So some people direct message us with a photo and tell us how they want their names represented. So this is an example. And then some people are making their own versions of the promise, which we had no like expectation or idea that would happen. Yep, yep. That was kind of just like this beautiful moment of humanity. They're like, oh, okay. Like they're doing it their own way and it's great. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes we get organizations, businesses, bands, and even cities. So um, it's kind of cool. We got involved with a community in Montrose, Michigan, who asked us to kind of make a, a promise for their citizens to get behind as a mechanism for kind of enforcing, you know, safety protocols, which is really fun. Um, best of all, sometimes we get dogs. We get dogs. Like, okay. So, um, Ruth, uh, Ruth, our friend, Ruth, who is also a promiser. She's a long hauler, amazing human. And this is her dog buttons. So we very much like seeing dogs helping out their parents to keep them happy during the pandemic yeah. and, and supporting, <laughs> supporting them. You're, you're doing your job as a leader, as a dog. <laughs> so the more verse, uh, visibility we can give those who are doing their parts, the better. Uh, we also need to recognize and support all the thousands of people and grassroots organizations who are working to end the pandemic. Make good together leaders who have been uh, convincing their friends and family who, to be more critical about in-person per gatherings, like people such as Noelle and Loria and Lonnie. Um, we have long haulers, like I said, Ruth, but long hauler promisers who have boldly chosen to be open and vulnerable in leading advocacy and awareness efforts for long COVID. Beth, Lauren, Shelby, uh, Ruth, Co uh, Colleen, Jessica, like there's too many to list. Like the, if we were to talk about leadership in the long COVID community, we would be here for four hours because they're really paving the way. Um, and we have promisers who have started and or leveraged their own grassroots organizations, such as Julie from Mass Together America, Vicky and Muhammad, who are rocking it over at Zero COVID Alliance, Joaquin, who you saw two spe three speakers ago with Green Zone Act Now, and then Fiona and team with Body Politic. And there are hundreds of people who are honing their skills at recognizing those cringe moments and are choosing the right and safe move every time. These actions matter. Like major thanks to everybody who has already made the promise, anybody who is going to make the promise moving forward, like you are incredible. We need to lift those up who are doing their part and not only put them in the spotlight, but recognize that they are the freaking spot. They're the spotlight. When we lead, we act as beacons, as light. And when we shine bright enough, it's hard for others not to take notice of that. Our sparkle inspires others to step up and be, become beacons as well. Modifying human behavior to mitigate the spread of the virus is critical. Human behavior plays a massive role in how successful any mitigation tool will be, such as vaccine rollouts and creation of green zones. Even with a vaccine available, we still have to face the challenges of getting the public to take on cohesive and necessary action needed to end the pandemic. We need to get everyone on board. Make Good Together's promise has the potential to help modify human behavior through social accountability to achieve the goal of eliminating the virus. So as we wrap our talk up, can you see how personal leadership within social circles is important? Bottom-up leadership is critical in ending the pandemic. We need you and everyone to be a visible pillar of personal leadership to help keep yourself and everyone else accountable and safe. Will you make the promise? 
If so, type, I promise, in the chat. Your influence runs deeper and spans, spans wider than you can ever imagine. Each of us can take accountability right now, exactly where we are. We can choose to be the leaders that the world needs. Choosing what's right over what's comfortable isn't easy, but it's necessary. We appreciate your endurance day after day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to make good together with you. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys, that was, that was great. Um, yeah, there's been a, a lot of activity in the chat that you probably couldn't see because you were screen sharing, but uh, if you wanna if you wanna scroll through, you can. Meanwhile, Katie mentioned she has a, a cringe story that she wrote. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay, yes. <laughs> well, um, early on in the pandemic, we're talking March, when a lot of people really thought I was crazy for being afraid of COVID. I, I agreed to go on an outdoor distance walk with my friend and her two kids who were nine and 11. And it was a really an awkward, terrible, not terrible, but kind of <laughs> terrible walk because I was like afraid because when the kids would get close, so I would sort of like, you know, dart away. Like I would, I would, I would keep creating space. And then my friend was like, you're making the kids feel upset. Like, you know, when you bring like the kids into it, it's like even like harder, like mama bears, of course. And so this is one of my best friends that I spend tons of time with. So early on navigating my boundaries and stuff, um, what, it was hard. I just acknowledge that it's hard. And, and I'm actually really happy that I met you guys because um, you give such good suggestions on how to sort of break the news to people that you have different boundaries in a loving way. And I think that's really been, helped like me do it a little bit more gracefully. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to say now months into the pandemic, um, my friend understands and um as she understands the seriousness of everything now um and uh you know things are okay but it was i just want to acknowledge that like it was it was tense and it's even harder when you bring in different generations you know children or elders um so yeah thank you and and thank you so much for your your guidance michelle and uh help uh with n coronavirus on social yes. media you taught taught us some good uh, skills on Instagram. And I love building that community with you. So thank awesome. you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. You're amazing. Like, likewise, I remember the first conversation we had with you just like lit up our world. So, so grateful to be a part of the community. That's extremely sweet. Thanks. Katie has that effect on people. She does. <laughs> Okay, so um, we've got about about six minutes left. Um, we have one more uh, person to, to speak shortly, and uh, it's actually, I have a, a quick video to share. Um, so uh, thank you, Michelle and Eric, for the uh, Make Good Together presentation. Uh, if anybody wants, there are links in the chat um, to their website. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me screen share really quick and uh, and show this video for like a, an, an introduction to our uh, our next speaker. Well, our next speaker is um, Julie Lamb. Um, she's actually one of Make Good Together's promisers. Uh, not only is she leading within her social circle to annihilate COVID nineteen, but she's leading within her community. Uh, she's helping promote mask wearing by using her talents as a photographer and a writer. Um, I'll start with a, a short video of Julie in action on the streets in, in New York City, and then we'll follow up with like a, a brief discussion to, uh, to end the session. So uh, Julie, welcome, thank you for being here. And uh, let me share screen really quick. And uh, let's see, share sound. Okay, here we go. Can you guys see this, anybody? Okay, I'm assuming yes. Yes, yes we, can, we can see it. <laughs> Make it full screen, yeah.
Okay. So that was our, our introduction to Julie. Julie, it seems like a very, very cool work that you're doing. Uh, thanks for being here. Can you tell us some more about this, uh, this photography project you have going on? Well, it started off as a, I think, uh, my desire to um, uh, raise awareness about mass use. Um, I, in March, um, when we started to, you know, have coronavirus in uh, New York, um, I was uh, really devastated. I started writing uh, stories and published them on Medium, um, but I, I wasn't really getting a big readership. And um, I didn't think that words uh, alone would be able to make any difference. So I uh, decided to take my camera out. <laughs> I'm actually a tech, um, a tech dino, like I'm, I really don't understand social media. Um, and I, I, I'm still learning about it. Um, but today, you know, Mass Together America, this grassroots um, awareness campaign uh, is on Facebook and Instagram. And we actually have, uh, I started this hashtag called uh, Mass Together America too. And we have like 2,858 posts um, and I basically was able to bring people together um, using my sort of like just being me, being a mom, like I'm nobody really. And I, I quit my career. I used to be, uh, I used to work in advertising uh, before I quit my career to take care of my son. Um, and uh, so I use my skill in marketing and advertising. Um, I have little understanding of uh, digital marketing because I quit at the time when, you know, it was just starting. So um, there was a lot to learn. There was a lot of obstacles. I didn't understand how to pull people together and uh, network on social media. But I just try to be honest. I share uh, my life story, my family life, and I... Um, visited all those um, uh, area where it was hit badly uh, in New York. Uh, when I went to uh, visit my family in Boston, I took my camera with me and forced my husband, you know, to stop at all different places. And I, um, I made myself a little badge and I told people, you know, how about I photograph you for mass awareness? And it was interesting, you know, people say, great idea who thought of that and so i said oh yeah you know so i i took these pictures and sometimes like i tag them they they will uh follow me and so i started to build this network really organically really like human to human and i find that you know in this horrible time um we really need human connections you know truly like tr just try to make friends. And um, I think that's how I started to build a community by really um, being very honest and authentic. And um, now I'm not just sharing my pictures, but I'm also sharing um, stories. Uh, I have a master degree in creative writing. After I stopped working in advertising, I pursue writing for many years. And I went back to graduate school, so I also can write. So I, I wanted to use all my skill um, to support the front line. I mean, I, I lost a, a friend who's a doctor. Um, and with I also have a lot of other friends that are uh, in the front line. And I said to myself, I can't just sit at home and do nothing. I mean, I have the skill uh, to create visuals and stories. So um, I just use everything I have to basically um, help create a community. And I think social media is interesting. You really have to understand how other people feel about um, this horrible time. They don't, there are a lot of denial. People don't really want to um, learn about the truth. Um, but if you, if you do something appealing to them, uh, you make beautiful. You make people look beautiful. 
Um, so I make an effort to raise the standard of all these posts so that they're not just like showing mass portraits, but mass portraits that share people's struggles. And at the same time, they have the strength to smile on camera, um, which is very ironic. But when people look at these pictures, they're like, I like that picture. I love that I look like that. And so they're happy to share the picture to all their friends. And with that, they're sharing the message. Um, and I also value all the friendship and support. I support everybody. I want to support all the mask makers, all the community that are trying their best to you know, make this work, um, all the advocates. I discovered that there are a lot of people, great people out there. They're doing the same thing. They're spreading the words, they need support. And so being a mom, I said, I should support all of them. They're all great people. We have a lot of responsible people in this world. So um, that's sort of my strategy is to support each other, um, not be competitive, but be inclusive. And I also make a huge effort is that as an artist, I have, I have a um, freedom. I have the freedom to decide who I want to photograph. I make sure that I'm showing America as a mosaic. I want to send that message out that we have to include everyone. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm sharing uh, like what I've done. And I just want to make sure I say one more time is that I'm not a leader and I'm really just a messenger. I, I'm happy to be a cheerleader and, and I enjoy, you know, the support and friendships. And I think we can get through this together. Great. I think, Julie, that, that's a great way to end our session. The next one's is starting right about now. Um, but it's it's nice to end on like a really concrete example of somebody just using their skills to take some action in their community. And uh, yeah, I think what you've done is amazing. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you for joining us. OK, everybody, uh, we have one last session uh, on uh, on policy. I'll, uh, I'll copy and paste a Zoom link in the chat, but uh, thank you everybody for attending. I hope everyone will follow Mass Together America. Yes, follow Mass Together America. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. We're going to go to the next session. There's the next session is posted in the chat. Thank you everyone so much. We'll see you in the other one. <laughs> Bye. See you in a minute. <laughs>